This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. A Baby Tramp by Ambrose Bierce If you had seen little Joe standing at the street corner in the rain, you would hardly have admired him. It was apparently an ordinary autumn rainstorm, but the water which fell upon Joe, who was hardly old enough to be either just or unjust, and so perhaps did not come under the law of impartial distribution, appeared to have some property peculiar to itself. One would have said it was dark and adhesive, sticky, but that could hardly be so, even in Blackburg where things certainly did occur that were a good deal out of the common. For example, ten or twelve years before, a shower of small frogs had fallen, as is credibly attested by a contemporaneous chronicle, the record concluding with a somewhat obscure statement to the effect that the chronicler considered it good growing weather for Frenchmen. Some years later Blackburg had a fall of crimson snow, it is cold in Blackburg when winter is on, and the snows are frequent and deep. There can be no doubt of it. The snow in this instance was of the colour of blood, and melted into water of the same hue, if water it was, not blood. The phenomenon had attracted wide attention, and science had as many explanations as there were scientists who knew nothing about it. But the men of Blackburg men who for many years had lived right there where the red snow fell, and might be supposed to know a good deal about the matter, shook their heads and said, Something would come of it. And something did, for the next summer was made memorable by the prevalence of a mysterious disease, epidemic, endemic, or the Lord knows what, though the physicians didn't, which carried away a full half of the population. Most of the other half carried themselves away, and were slow to return, but finally came back, and were now increasing and multiplying as before. But Blackburg had not since been altogether the same. Of quite another kind, though equally out of the common, was the incident of Hetty Parlow's ghost. Hetty Parlow's maiden name had been Brownon, and in Blackburg that meant more than one would think. The Brownons had, from time immemorial, from the very earliest of the old colonial days, been the leading family of the town. It was the richest, and it was the best, and Blackburg would have shed the last drop of its plebeian blood in defence of the Brownon fair fame. As few of the family's members had ever been known to live permanently away from Blackburg, although most of them were educated elsewhere, and nearly all had travelled, there was quite a number of them. The men held most of the public offices, and the women were foremost in all good works. Of these latter, Hetty was most beloved, by reason of the sweetness of her disposition, the purity of her character, and her singular personal beauty. She married in Boston a young scapegrace named Parlow, and, like a good Brownon, brought him back to Blackburg forthwith, made a man and a town councillor of him. They had a child which they named Joseph, and dearly loved, as was then the fashion among parents in all that region. Then they died of the mysterious disorder already mentioned, and at the age of one whole year Joseph set up as an orphan. Unfortunately for Joseph, the disease which had cut off his parents did not stop at that. It went on and extirpated nearly the whole Brownon contingent and its allies by marriage, and those who fled did not return. The tradition was broken, the Brownon estates passed into alien hands, and the only Brownons remaining in that place were underground in Oak Hill Cemetery where, indeed, was a colony of them powerful enough to resist the encroachment of surrounding tribes, and hold the best part of the grounds. But about the ghost. One night, 
about three years after the death of Hetty Parlow, a number of the young people of Blackburg were passing Oak Hill Cemetery in a wagon. If you have been there, you will remember that the road to Greenton runs alongside it on the south. They had been attending a May Day festival at Greenton, and that serves to fix the date. Altogether there may have been a dozen, and a jolly party they were, considering the legacy of gloom left by the town's recent sombre experiences. As they passed the cemetery, the man driving suddenly reined in his team with an exclamation of surprise. It was sufficiently surprising, no doubt, for just ahead, and almost at the roadside, though inside the cemetery, stood the ghost of Hetty Parlow. There could be no doubt of it, for she had been personally known to every youth and maiden in the party. That established the thing's identity. Its character as ghost was signified by all the customary signs. The shroud, the long undone hair, the far-away look, everything. This disquieting apparition was stretching out its arms towards the west, as if in supplication for the evening star, which certainly was an alluring object, though obviously out of reach. As they all sat silent, so the story goes, every member of that party of merrymakers, they had merry made on coffee and lemonade only, distinctly heard that ghost call the name, Joey! Joey! A moment later, nothing was there. Of course, one does not have to believe all that. Now at that moment, as was afterwards ascertained, Joey was wandering about in the sagebrush on the opposite side of the continent, near Winnemucca, in the state of Nevada. He had been taken to that town by some good persons distantly related to his dead father, and by them adopted and tenderly cared for. But on that evening the poor child had strayed from home and was lost in the desert. His after-history is involved in obscurity, and has gaps which conjecture alone can fill. It is known that he was found by a family of Paiute Indians, who kept the little wretch with them for a time, and then sold him, actually sold him for money to a woman on one of the east-bound trains, at a station a long way from Winnemucca. The woman professed to have made all manner of inquiries, but all in vain. So, being childless and a widow, she adopted him herself. At this point of his career Joe seemed to be getting a long way from the condition of orphanage, the interposition of a multitude of parents between himself and that woeful state promised him a long immunity from its disadvantages. Mrs. Darnell, his newest mother, lived in Cleveland, Ohio, but her adopted son did not long remain with her. He was seen one afternoon by a policeman new to that beat, deliberately toddling away from her house, and being questioned, answered that he was a doing home. He must have travelled by rail somehow, for three days later he was in the town of Whiteville, which, as you know, is a long way from Blackburg. His clothing was in pretty fair condition, but he was sinfully dirty. Unable to give any account of himself, he was arrested as a vagrant, and sentenced to imprisonment in the infant's sheltering home, where he was washed. Joe ran away from the infant's sheltering home at Whiteville, just took to the woods one day, and the home knew him no more for ever. We find him next, or rather get back to him, standing forlorn in the cold autumn rain at a suburban street corner in Blackburg, and it seems right to explain now that the raindrops falling upon him there were really not dark and gummy. They only failed to make his face and hands less so. Joe was indeed fearfully and wonderfully besmirched, as by the hand of an artist. And the forlorn little tramp had no shoes. His feet were bare, red, and swollen, and when he walked he limped with both legs. As to clothing, Ah, you would hardly have had the skill to name any single garment that he wore, 
or say by what magic he kept it upon him. That he was cold all over and all through did not admit of a doubt. He knew it himself. Anyone would have been cold there that evening. But for that reason no one else was there. How Joe came to be there himself he could not, for the flickering little life of him, have told, even if gifted with a vocabulary exceeding a hundred words. From the way he stared about him one could have seen that he had not the faintest notion of where, nor why, he was. Yet he was not altogether a fool in his day and generation. Being cold and hungry, and still able to walk a little by bending his knees very much indeed, and putting his feet down toes first, he decided to enter one of the houses which flanked the street at long intervals, and looked so bright and warm. But when he attempted to act upon that very sensible decision, a burly dog came browsing out and disputed his right. Inexpressibly frightened, and believing, no doubt, with some reason too, that brutes without meant brutality within, he hobbled away from all the houses, and with grey, wet fields to right of him, and grey, wet fields to left of him, with the rain half-blinding him, and the night coming in mist and darkness, held his way along the road that leads to Greenton, that is to say, the road leads those to Greenton who succeed in passing the Oak Hill Cemetery. A considerable number every year do not. Joe did not. They found him there the next morning, very wet, very cold, but no longer hungry. He had apparently entered the cemetery gate, hoping perhaps that it led to a house where there was no dog, and gone blundering about in the darkness falling over many a grave, no doubt, until he had tired of it all and given up. The little body lay upon one side, with one soiled cheek upon one soiled hand, the other hand tucked away among the rags to make it warm, the other cheek washed, clean and white at last, as for a kiss from one of God's great angels. It was observed though nothing was thought of it at the time, the body being as yet unidentified, that the little fellow was lying upon the grave of Hetty Parlow. The grave, however, had not opened to receive him. That is a circumstance which, without actual irreverence, one may wish had been ordered otherwise. End of story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. This is read and recorded by Don Morgan in North Carolina, USA. Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat For the most wild yet most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad I am not, and very surely do I not dream. But tomorrow I die, and today I would unburden my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world, plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events. In their consequences, these events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Yet I will not attempt to expound them. To me they have presented little but horror. To many 
they will seem less terrible than Baroque. Hereafter, perhaps, some intellect may be found which will reduce my phantasm to the commonplace, some calmer intellect, more logical, less excitable than mine, will perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. From my infancy I was noted for the docility and humanity of my disposition. My tenderness of heart was even so conspicuous as to make me the jest of my companions. I was especially fond of animals, and was indulged by my parents with a great variety of pets. With these I spent most of my time, and never was so happy as when feeding and caressing them. This peculiarity of my character grew with my growth, and in my manhood I derived from it one of my principal sources of pleasure. To those who have cherished an affection for a faithful and sagacious dog, I need hardly be at the trouble of explaining the nature or the intensity of the gratification thus derived. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the heart of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. I married early, and was happy to find in my wife a disposition not uncongenial with my own. Observing my partiality for domestic pets, she lost no opportunity for procuring those of the most agreeable kind. We had birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, a small monkey, and a cat. This latter was a remarkably large and beautiful animal, entirely black and sagacious, to an astonishing degree. In speaking of its intelligence, my wife, who at heart was not a little tinctured with superstition, made frequent allusion to the ancient popular notion which regarded all black cats as witches in disguise. Not that she was ever serious upon this point. That I mention the matter at all is for no better reason than it happens just now to be remembered. Pluto, this was the cat's name, was my favorite pet and playmate. I alone fed him, and he attended me whenever I went about the house. It was even with difficulty that I could prevent him from following me through the streets. Our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had experienced a radical alteration for the worst. I grew day by day more moody, more irritable, more regardless of the feelings of others. I suffered myself to use intemperate language to my wife, and at length I even offered her personal violence. My pets, of course, were made to feel the change in my disposition. I not only neglected but ill-used them. For Pluto, However, I still retained sufficient regard to restrain me from maltreating him, as I made no scruple of maltreating the rabbits, the monkey, or even the dog, when, by accident or through affection, they got in my way. But my disease grew upon me, for what disease is like alcohol? And at length even Pluto who was now becoming old and consequently somewhat peevish, began to experience the effects of my ill temper. One night, returning home, much intoxicated from one of my haunts about town, I fancied that the cat avoided my presence. I seized him, and in his fright at my violence, 
he inflicted a slight wound upon my hand with his teeth. The fury of a demon instantly possessed me. I knew myself no longer. My original soul seemed at once to take flight from my body, and a more than fiendish malevolence, gin-nurtured, thrilled every fiber of my frame. I took from my waistcoat pocket a pen-knife, opened it, grasped the poor beast by the throat, and deliberately cut one of its eyes from the socket. I blush, I burn, I shudder when I pin the damnable atrocity. When reason returned with the morning, when I had slept off the fumes of the night's debauch, I experienced a sentiment half of horror, half of remorse, for the crime of which I had been guilty. But it was at best a feeble and equivocal feeling, and the soul remained untouched. I again plunged into excess and soon drowned in wine all memory of the deed. In the meantime, the cat slowly recovered. The socket of the lost eye presented, it is true, a frightful appearance. But he no longer appeared to suffer any pain. He went about the house as usual, but, as might be expected, fled in extreme terror at my approach. I had so much of my old heart left as to be at first grieved by this evident dislike on the part of a creature which had once so loved me, but this feeling soon gave place to irritation, and then came, as if to my final and irrevocable overthrow, the spirit of perverseness. Of this spirit philosophy takes no account. I am not more sure that my soul lives than that perverseness is one of the primitive impulses of the human heart, one of the indivisible primary faculties, or sentiments, which give direction to the character of man. Who has not, a hundred times, found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason than because he knows he should not? Have we not a perpetual inclination in the teeth of our best judgment to violate that which is law merely because we understand it to be such? This spirit of perverseness, I say, came to my final overthrow. It was this unfathomable longing of the soul to vex itself, to offer violence to its own nature, to do wrong for wrong's sake only, that urged me to continue and finally to consummate the injury I had inflicted upon the unoffending brute. One morning, in cold blood, I slipped a noose about its neck and hung it to the limb of a tree, hung it with the tears streaming from my eyes and with the bitterest remorse at my heart, hung it because I knew that it had loved me and had given me no reason of offense, hung it because I knew that in so doing I was committing a sin, a deadly sin that would so jeopardize my immortal soul as to place it, if such a thing were possible, even beyond the reach of the infinite mercy of the most merciful and most terrible God. On the night of the day on which this cruel deed was done, I was aroused from sleep by the cry of fire. The curtains of my bed were in flames. The whole house was blazing. It was with great difficulty that my wife, a servant, and myself made our escape from the conflagration. The destruction was complete. My entire worldly wealth was swallowed up, and I resigned myself thenceforward to despair. I am above the weakness of seeking to establish a sequence of cause and effect between the disaster and the atrocity. 
but I am detailing a chain of facts and wish not to leave even a possible link imperfect. On the day succeeding the fire, I visited the ruins. The walls, with one exception, had fallen in. This exception was found in a compartment wall, not very thick, which stood about the middle of the house and against which had rested the head of my bed. The plastering had here in great measure resisted the action of the fire, a fact which I attributed to it having been recently spread. About this wall a dense crowd had collected, and many persons seemed to be examining a particular portion of it with very minute and eager attention. Their words, strange, singular, and other similar expressions, excited my curiosity. I approached and saw, as if graven in bas-relief upon the white surface, the figure of a gigantic cat. The impression was given with an accuracy truly marvelous. There was a rope about the animal's neck. When I first beheld this apparition, for I could scarcely regard it as less, my wonder and my terror were extreme. But at length reflection came to my aid. The cat, I remembered, had been hung in a garden adjacent to the house. Upon the alarm of fire, this garden had been immediately filled by the crowd. Someone must have cut down the animal from the tree and thrown it through an open window into my chamber. This had probably been done with the view of arousing me from sleep. The falling of other walls had compressed the victim of my cruelty into the substance of the freshly spread plaster, the lime of which, with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass, had then accomplished the portraiture, as I saw it. Although I thus readily accounted to my reason, if not altogether to my conscience, for the startling fact just detailed, it did not fail to make a deep impression upon my fancy. For months I could not rid myself of the phantasm of the cat and during this period there came back into my spirit a half-sentiment that seemed, but was not, remorse. I went so far as to regret the loss of the animal, and to look about me among the vile haunts which I now habitually frequented for another pet of the same species, and of somewhat similar appearance, to take its place. One night, as I sat, half stupefied in some din of infamy, my attention was suddenly drawn to a black object reposing on the head of one of the immense casks of gin, or of rum, which constituted the chief furniture of this apartment. I had been looking steadily at the top of this cask for some minutes, and what now caused me surprise was the fact that I had not sooner perceived the object thereupon. I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, and a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white covering nearly the whole region of the breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately arose, purred loudly, rubbed against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature of which I was in search. I at once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, and had never seen it before. I continued my caresses and when I prepared to go home the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house, it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, 
I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated. I know not how or why it was, but its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed me. By slow degrees these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into the bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature, yet a certain sense of shame and the remembrance of my former deed of cruelty prevented me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added, no doubt, to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it also had been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I already have said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which once had been my distinguishing trait and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pertinacity which it would be difficult to make the reader comprehend. Whenever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair, or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and thus nearly throw me down, or fastening its long and sharp claws in my clothes, clamor in this manner to my breast. At such times, although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so, partly by a memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how otherwise to define it. I am almost ashamed to own, yes, even in this felon's cell I am almost ashamed to own that the terror and horror with which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would be possible to conceive. My wife had called attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite, but by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this above all I loathed and dreaded and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now I say the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, the gallows. O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death! And now I was indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity. A brute beast, whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, a man fashioned in the image of the high God, so much insufferable woe, alas! Neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the day the creature left me no moment alone, and in the night 
I started hourly from dreams of unutterable fear to find the hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressure of torments such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased to hatred of all things and of all mankind while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outburst of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most usual and the most patient of sufferers. One day she accompanied me upon some household errand into the cellar of the old building which our poverty compelled us to inhabit. The cat followed me down the steep stairs, and, nearly throwing me headlong, exasperated me to madness. I uplifted an axe, forgetting in my wrath the childish dread which had hitherto stayed my hand. I aimed a blow at the animal, which, of course, would have proved instantly fatal had the axe descended as I wished. But this blow was arrested by the hand of my wife. Goaded by the interference into a rage more than demonical, I withdrew my arm from her grasp and buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot without a groan. This hideous murder accomplished, I set myself forthwith, and with entire deliberation to the task of concealing the body. I knew that I could not remove it from the house, either by day or by night, without running the risk of being observed by the neighbors. Many projects entered my mind. At one period I thought of cutting the corpse into minute fragments and destroying them by fire. At another I resolved to dig a grave for it in the floor of the cellar. Again I deliberated about casting it into the well in the yard, or packing it in a box like merchandise and getting a porter to take it from the house. Finally I hit upon what I considered a far better expedient than either of these. I determined to wall it up in the cellar, as the monks in the Middle Ages are recorded to have walled up their victims. For a purpose such as this, the cellar was well adapted. Its walls were loosely constructed, and had lately been plastered throughout with a rough plaster which the dampness of the atmosphere had prevented from hardening. Moreover, in one of the walls was a projection caused by a false chimney or fireplace that had been filled up and made to resemble the rest of the cellar. I had no doubt that I could readily displace the bricks at this point, insert the corpse, and wall the hole up as before, so that no one could detect anything suspicious. And in this calculation I was not deceived. By means of a crowbar I easily dislodged the bricks, and having carefully deposited the body against the inner wall, I propped it in that position while, with little trouble, I relayed the whole structure as it had originally stood. Having procured mortar, sand, and hair with every possible precaution, I prepared a plaster which could not be distinguished from the old. With this I carefully went over the new brickwork. When I had finished I felt satisfied that all was right. The wall did not present the slightest appearance of having been disturbed. The rubble on the floor, the only evidence of my work, I picked up with the minutest care. I looked around triumphantly and said to myself, Here, at least, then, my labor has not been in vain. 
My next step was to look for the beast which had been the cause of so much wretchedness, for I had at length firmly resolved to put it to death. Had I been able to meet with it at that moment, there could have been no doubt of its fate, but it appeared that the crafty animal had been alarmed at the violence of my previous anger and forbore to present itself in my present mood. It is impossible to describe or to imagine the deep, the blissful sense of relief which the absence of the detested creature occasioned in my bosom. It did not make its appearance during the night, and thus, for the first night, since its introduction into the house, I soundly and tranquilly slept, I slept even with the burden of murder upon my soul. The second and the third day passed, and still my tormentor came not. Once again I breathed as a free man. The monster, in terror, had fled the premises forever. I should behold it no more. My happiness was supreme. The guilt of my dark deed disturbed me but little. Some few inquiries had been made, but these had been readily answered. A search had even been instituted, but of course nothing was to be discovered. I looked upon my future felicity as finally secure. Upon the fourth day of the assassination, a party of the police came unexpectedly into the house and proceeded again to make rigorous investigation of the premises. Secure in the inscrutability of my place of concealment, I felt no embarrassment whatever. The officers bade me accompany them in their search. They left no nook or corner unexplored. At length, for the third or fourth time, they descended into the cellar. I quivered not in a muscle. My heart beat as calmly as that of one who slumbers in innocence. I walked the cellar from end to end. I folded my arms upon my bosom and roamed easily to and fro. The police were thoroughly satisfied and prepared to depart. The glee in my heart was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say a word by way of triumph, and to render doubly sure their assurance of my guiltlessness. "'Gentlemen,' I said at last, as the party ascended the steps, "'I am delighted to have allayed your suspicions. I wish you all health, and a little more courtesy. By the way, gentlemen, this, this is a very well-constructed house.' In the rabid desire to say something easily, I scarcely knew what I uttered. I may say an excellently well-constructed house. These walls are, are you going, gentlemen? These walls are solidly put together. Here, through the mere frenzy of bravado, I rapped heavily upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of my wife. But may God shield and deliver me from the fangs of the arch-fiend! No sooner had the reverberation of my blows sunk into silence than I was answered by a voice from within the tomb, by a cry at first muffled and broken, like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud, and continuous scream, utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exalt in the damnation. Of my own thoughts it is folly to speak. 
swooning, I staggered to the opposite wall. For one instant, the party on the stairs remained motionless through extremity of terror and of awe. In the next, a dozen stout arms were toiling at the wall. It fell bodily. The corpse, already greatly decayed and clotted with gore, stood erect before the eyes of the spectators. Upon its head, with red extended mouth and solitary eye of fire, sat the hideous beast, whose craft had seduced me into murder, and whose informing voice had consigned me to the hangman. I had walled the monster up within the tomb. This concludes Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Zach Weissmuller and Ryan Huser, www.retronetworks.com. The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe the thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish but punished with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face and he did not perceive that my smile now was the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack, but in the matter of old wines he was sincere. In this respect I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting, party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. My dear Fortunato, you're luckily met. How remarkably well you're looking today. But I've received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How? Amontillado? A pipe? Impossible! And in the middle of the carnival! I have my doubts. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? And I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you're engaged, I'm on my way to Lucchesi. If anyone has a critical turn, it's he. He will tell me. Uh, Lucchesi cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet, some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchesi... I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you're afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They're encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. 
The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchesi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a rocolar closely about my person. I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together on the damp grounds of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe? It is farther on. But observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Niter? Niter. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> <coughs> it is nothing. Come. We will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchesi. Enough! The, the coughs are mere nothing. It, it will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medic will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink to be buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults are extensive. The Montresors were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune l'assassit. Good. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medic. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made a bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The niter! See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults, or below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we'll go back ere it's too late. Your cough. It is nothing. Let us go on. But, uh, but first, another drought of the medic. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend? Not I. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, 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 yes. You? I impossible! A Mason? A Mason. A sign, a, a sign. It is this. I produced a trowel from beneath the folds of my rocolar. You jest. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so. I replaced the tool beneath the cloak and again offered him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt, 
in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeaux rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet in width, three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use within itself, but formed merely the interval between the two colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchesi... He is an ignoramus. He stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand! Over the wall, you cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But first, I must render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! True. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier. And the third. And the fourth. And then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I seized my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel, and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeaux over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the human form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. Ah! I replied to the yells of him who clamored. Ah! Ah! I re-echoed. Ah! I aided. Ah! I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. 
I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight, I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. <laughs> a very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado. Uh, yes, the Amontillado. Oh, but is it now getting late? Will not they be waiting us, awaiting us at the Palazzo? The, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. Fortunato! No answer. Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust the torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in reply only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end to my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requesat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Diamond Necklace by Guy de Maupassant The girl was one of those pretty and charming young creatures who sometimes are born, as if by a slip of fate, into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no way of being known, understood, loved, married by any rich and distinguished man. So she let herself be married by to a little clerk of the Ministry of Public Instruction. She dressed plainly, because she could not dress well, but she was unhappy, as if she had really fallen from a higher station, since with women there is neither caste nor rank, for beauty, grace, and charm take the place of family and birth. Natural ingenuity, instinct for what is elegant, a supple mind, are their sole hierarchy, and often make of women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. Mathilde suffered ceaselessly, feeling herself born to enjoy all delicacies and all luxuries. She was distressed at the poverty of her dwelling, at the bareness of the walls, at the shabby chairs, the ugliness of the curtains. All those things, of which another woman of her rank would not even have been conscious, tortured her and made her angry. The sight of the little Breton peasant who did her humble housework aroused in her despairing regrets and bewildering dreams. She thought of the silent antechambers hung with oriental tapestry, illumined by tall bronze candelabra, and of two great footmen in knee breeches, who sleep in the big armchairs, made drowsy by the oppressive heat of the stove. She thought of long reception halls hung with ancient silk, of the dainty cabinets containing priceless curiosities, and of the little coquettish perfumed reception rooms made for chatting at five o'clock with intimate friends with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. When she sat down to dinner, before the round table covered with a tablecloth in use three days, opposite her husband, who uncovered the soup tureen and declared with a delighted air, Ah, the good soup! I don't know anything better than that! She thought of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of tapestry peopled the walls with ancient personages and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest. And she thought of delicious dishes served on marvelous plates and of the whispered gallantries to which you listen with a sphinx-like smile while you are eating the pink meat of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no gowns, no jewels, nothing. And she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that, 
she would have liked so much to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, who was rich, and whom she did not like to go to see any more, because she felt so sad when she came home. But one evening her husband reached home with a triumphant air, and holding a large envelope in his hand. There, said he, there is something for you. She tore the paper quickly, and drew out a printed card which bore these words. The Minister of Public Instruction and Madame Georges Rampagneau request the honor of Monsieur and Madame Loisel's company at the Palace of the Ministry on Monday evening, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation on the table crossly, muttering, "'What do you wish me to do with that?' "'Why, my dear, I thought you would be glad. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had great trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go. It is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there.' She looked at him with an irritated glance, and said impatiently, "'And what do you wish me to put on my back?' He had not thought of that. He stammered, "'Why, why, the gown you go to the theatre in. It looks very well to me.' He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was weeping. Two great tears ran slowly from the corners of her eyes towards the corners of her mouth. "'What's the matter? What's the matter?' he answered. By a violent effort she conquered her grief, and replied in a calm voice, while she wiped her wet cheeks, "'Nothing, only I have no gown, and therefore I can't go to this ball. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better equipped than I am.' He was in despair. He resumed, "'Come, let us see, Mathilde. How much would it cost, a suitable gown, which you could use on other occasions, something very simple?' She reflected several seconds, making her calculations, and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally she replied, hesitating, "'I, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage it with four hundred francs.' He grew a little pale, because he was laying aside just that amount to buy a gun, and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plain of Nanterre with several friends who went to shoot larks there of a Sunday. But he said, "'Very well. I will give you four hundred francs, and try to have a pretty gown.' The day of the ball drew near, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, uneasy, anxious. Her frock was ready, however. Her husband said to her one evening, "'What is the matter? Come!' "'You have seemed very queer these last three days.' "'And she answered, "'It annoys me not to have a single piece of jewellery, "'not a single ornament, nothing to put on. "'I shall look poverty-stricken. "'I would almost rather not go at all.' "'You might wear natural flowers,' said her husband. "'They are very stylish at this time of year. "'For ten francs you could get two or three magnificent roses.' She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among other women who are rich. How stupid you are, her husband cried. Go look up your friend, Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you some jewels. You're intimate enough with her to do that. She uttered a cry of joy. True, I never thought of it. The next day she went to her friend and told her of her distress. Madame Forestier went to a wardrobe with a mirror, took out a large jewel-box, brought it back, opened it, and said to Madame Loisel, "'Choose, my dear.' She saw first some bracelets, then a pearl necklace, then a Venetian gold cross set with precious stones, of admirable workmanship. She tried on the ornaments before the mirror, hesitated, and could not make up her mind to part with them, to give them back. She kept asking, "'Haven't you any more?' "'Why, yes, look further. I don't know what you like.' Suddenly she discovered, in a black satin box, a superb diamond necklace, and her heart throbbed with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. 
she fastened it round her throat, outside her high-necked waist, and was lost in ecstasy at her reflection in the mirror. Then she asked, hesitating, filled with anxious doubt, "'Will you lend me this, only this?' "'Why, yes, certainly.' She threw her arms around her friend's neck, kissed her passionately, then fled with her treasure. The night of the ball arrived. Madame Loisel was a great success. She was prettier than any other woman present, elegant, graceful, smiling and wild with joy. All the men looked at her, asked her name, sought to be introduced. All the attachés of the cabinet wished to waltz with her. She was remarked by the minister himself. She danced with rapture, with passion, intoxicated by pleasure, forgetting all in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success, in a sort of cloud of happiness comprised of all this homage, admiration, these awakened desires, and of that sense of triumph which is so sweet to woman's heart. She left the ball about four o'clock in the morning. Her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted anteroom with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying the ball. He threw over her shoulders the wraps he had brought, the modest wraps of common life, the poverty of which contrasted with the elegance of the ball dress. She felt this, and wished to escape so as not to be remarked by the other women, who were enveloping themselves in costly furs. Loiselle held her back, saying, "'Wait a bit. You will catch cold outside. I will call a cab.' But she did not listen to him, and rapidly descended the stairs. When they reached the street, they could not find a carriage, and began to look for one, shouting after the cabmen passing at a distance. They went towards the sun in despair, shivering with cold. At last they found on the quay one of those ancient night-cabs which— as though they were ashamed to show their shabbiness during the day, are never seen round Paris until after dark. It took them to their dwelling in the Rue des Martyrs, and sadly they mounted the steps to their flat. All was ended for her. As to him, he reflected that he must be at the ministry at ten o'clock that morning. She removed her wraps before the glass, so as to see herself once more in all her glory. But suddenly she uttered a cry— she no longer had the necklace around her neck. "'What is the matter with you?' demanded her husband, already half undressed. She turned distractedly toward him. "'I have—I have—I have lost Madame Forestier's necklace!' she cried. He stood up, bewildered. "'What? How? Impossible!' They looked among the folds of her skirt, of her cloak, in her pockets— everywhere, but did not find it. "'You're sure you had it on you when you left the ball?' he asked. "'Yes, I felt it in the vestibule of the minister's house.' "'But if you had lost it in the street, we should have heard it fall. It must be in the cab.' "'Yes, probably. Did you take his number?' "'No. And you—didn't you notice it?' "'No.' They looked— thunderstruck at each other. At last Loisel put on his clothes. "'I shall go back on foot,' said he, "'over the whole route, to see whether I can find it.' He went out. She sat waiting on a chair in her ball-dress, without strength to go to bed, overwhelmed, without any fire, without a thought. Her husband returned about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to police headquarters— to newspaper offices to offer a reward. He went to the cab companies, everywhere, in fact, whither he was urged by the least spark of hope. She waited all day, in the same condition of mad fear before this terrible calamity. Loisel returned at night with a hollow, pale face. He had discovered nothing. "'You must write to your friend,' said he, "'that you have broken the clasp of her necklace, and that you are having it mended.' That will give us time to turn round. She wrote at his dictation. At the end of a week they had lost all hope. Loisel, who had aged five years, declared, We must consider how to replace that ornament. The next day they took the box that had contained it and went to the jeweler whose name was found within. 
he consulted his books. "'It was not I, madam, who sold that necklace. I must have simply furnished the case.' Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, trying to recall it, both sick with chagrin and grief. They found, in a shop at the Palais Royal, a string of diamonds that seemed to them exactly like the ones they had lost. It was worth forty thousand francs. They could have it for thirty-six. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet and they made a bargain that he should buy it back for thirty-four thousand francs, in case they should find the lost necklace before the end of February. Loisel possessed eighteen thousand francs, which his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. He did borrow, asking a thousand francs of one, five hundred of another, five louis here, three louis there. He gave notes, took up ruinous obligations, dealt with usurers and all the race of lenders. He compromised all the rest of his life, risked signing a note without even knowing whether he could meet it, and frightened by the trouble yet to come, by the black misery that was about to fall upon him, by the prospect of all the physical privations and moral tortures that he was to suffer, he went to get the new necklace, laying upon the jeweler's counter thirty-six thousand francs. When Madame Loisel took back the necklace, Madame Forster said to her, with a chilly manner, "'You should have returned it sooner. "'I might have needed it.' "'She did not open the case, "'as her friend had so much feared. "'If she had detected the substitution, "'what would she have thought? "'What would she have said? "'Would she not have taken Madame Loisel for a thief?' "'Thereafter, Madame Loisel knew the horrible existence of the needy. "'She bore her part, however, with sudden heroism. "'That dreadful debt must be paid.' she would pay it. They dismissed their servant, they changed their lodgings, they rented a garret under the roof. She came to know what heavy housework meant, and the odious cares of the kitchen. She washed the dishes, using her dainty fingers and rosy nails on greasy pots and pans. She washed the soiled linen, the shirts and the dishcloths, which she dried upon a line. She carried the slops down to the street every morning, and carried up the water, stopping for breath at every landing. And dressed like a woman of the people, she went to the fruiterer, the grocer, the butcher, a basket on her arm, bargaining, meeting with impertinence, defending her miserable money, sou by sou. Every month they had to meet some notes, renew others, obtain more time. Her husband worked evenings, making up a tradesman's accounts, and late at night, he often copied manuscript for five sous a page. This life lasted ten years. At the end of ten years they had paid everything, everything, with the rates of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. Madame Loisel looked old now. She had become the woman of impoverished households, strong and hard and rough. With frowsy hair, skirts askew and red hands, she talked loud while washing the floors with great swishes of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window, and she thought of that gay evening of long ago, of that ball where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How strange and changeful is life! How small a thing is needed to make or ruin us! But one Sunday, having gone to take a walk in the Champs-Élysées to refresh herself after the labors of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Madame Forestier, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Loisel felt moved. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she should tell her all about it. Why not? She went up. Good day, Jean. The other, astonished to be familiarly addressed by this plain good wife, did not recognize her at all, and stammered, But, madame, I do not know. You must have been mistaken. No, I am Mathilde Le Seul. Her friend uttered a cry. Oh, my poor Mathilde! 
"'How you are changed! "'Yes, I have had a pretty hard life since I saw you last, "'and a great poverty, and that because of you. "'Of me? How so? "'Do you remember that diamond necklace "'you lent me to wear at the ministerial ball? "'Yes. Well? "'Well, I lost it. "'What do you mean? You brought it back.' I brought you back another exactly like it, and it has taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us, for us who had nothing, and at last it is ended, and I am very glad. Madame Forestier had stopped. You say that you brought a necklace of diamonds to replace mine. Yes, you never noticed it then. They were very similar. "'and she smiled with a joy that was at once proud and ingenuous. "'Madame Forestier, deeply moved, took her hands. "'Oh, my poor Mathilde! "'Why, my necklace was paste! "'It was worth at most only five hundred francs!' "'End of The Diamond Necklace Recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. "'For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, "'please visit... LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Ian Bartholomew, Taipei, Taiwan, January 27, 2006. Esme by Saki, H. H. Munro, from the Chronicles of Clovis. Esme. All hunting stories are the same, said Clovis. Just as all turf stories are the same. And all. "'My hunting story isn't a bit like any you've ever heard,' said the Baroness. "'It happened quite a while ago, when I was about twenty-three. "'I wasn't living apart from my husband then. "'You see, neither of us could afford to make the other a separate allowance. "'In spite of everything that proverbs may say, "'poverty keeps together more homes than it breaks up. "'But we always hunted with different packs.' All this has nothing to do with the story. We haven't arrived at the meet yet. I suppose there was a meet, said Clovis. Of course there was a meet, said the Baroness. All the usual crowd were there, especially Constance Broddle. Constance is one of those strapping, florid girls that go so well with autumn scenery or Christmas decorations in church. I feel a presentiment that something dreadful is going to happen, she said to me. Am I looking pale? She was looking about as pale as a beetroot that has suddenly heard bad news. You're looking nicer than usual, I said, but that's so easy for you. Before she had got the right bearing on this remark, we settled down to business. Hounds had found a fox lying out in some gorse bushes. I knew it, said Clovis. In every fox hunting story I've ever heard, there's been a fox and some gorse bushes. Constance and I were well mounted, continued the Baroness serenely, and we had no difficulty in keeping ourselves in the first flight, though it was a fairly stiff run. Towards the finish, however, we must have held rather too independent a line, for we lost the hound and found ourselves plodding aimlessly along, miles away from anywhere. It was fairly exasperating, and my temper was beginning to let itself go by inches, when on pushing our way through an accommodating hedge, we were gladdened by the sight of hounds in full cry in a hollow just beneath us. "'There they go!' said Constance, and then added in a gasp, "'In heaven's name! What are they hunting? It was certainly no mortal fox. It stood more than twice as high, had a short, ugly head, and an enormous, thick neck. It's a hyena, I cried. It must have escaped from Lord Pabham's park. At that moment, the hunted beast turned and faced its pursuers, and the hounds, there were only about six couple of them, stood round in a half-circle and looked foolish. 
Evidently, they had broken away from the rest of the pack on the trail of this alien scent, and were not quite sure how to treat their quarry now that they had got him. The hyena hailed our approach with unmistakable relief, and demonstrations of friendliness. It had probably been accustomed to uniform kindness from humans, while its first experience of a pack of hounds had left a bad impression. The hounds looked more than ever embarrassed as their quarry paraded its sudden intimacy with us, and the faint toot of a horn in the distance was seized on as a welcome signal for an unobtrusive departure. Constance and I, and the hyena, were left alone in the gathering twilight. "'What are we to do?' asked Constance. "'What a person you are for questions,' I said. "'Well, we can't stay here all night with the hyena,' she retorted. "'I don't know what your ideas of comfort are,' I said. "'But I shouldn't think of staying here all night even without a hyena. "'My home may be an unhappy one. At least it has hot and cold water laid on, and domestic service, and other conveniences which we should not find here. We had better make for the ridge of trees to the right. I imagine the Crawley Road is just beyond. We trotted off slowly along a faintly marked cart track, with the beast following cheerfully at our heels. What on earth are we to do with the hyena? came the inevitable question. "'What does one generally do with hyenas?' I asked crossly. "'I've never had anything to do with hyenas,' said Constance. "'Well, neither have I. "'If we even knew it's sex, we might give it a name. "'Perhaps we might call it Esme. "'That would do for either case. "'There was still sufficient daylight for us to distinguish wayside objects, "'and our listless spirits gave an upward perk.' as we came upon a small half-naked gypsy brat picking blackberries from a low-growing bush. The sudden apparition of two horsemen and a hyena set us off crying, and in any case we would scarcely have gleaned any useful geographical information from that source. But there was a probability that we might strike a gypsy encampment somewhere along our route. We rode on hopefully, but uneventfully, for another mile or so. "'I wonder what the child was doing there,' said Constance presently. "'Picking blackberries, obviously.' "'I don't like the way it cried,' pursued Constance. "'Somehow its wail keeps ringing in my ears.' "'I did not chide Constance for her morbid fantasies. "'As a matter of fact, the same sensation of being pursued by a persistent, fretful wail forced itself on my rather overtired nerves. For company's sake, I hallooed to Esme, who had lagged somewhat behind. With a few springy bounds, he drew up level, and then shot past us. The wailing accompaniment was explained. The gypsy child was firmly, and I expect painfully, held in his jaws. "'Merciful heaven!' screamed Constance. "'What on earth shall we do? What are we to do?' "'I am perfectly certain that at the last judgment "'Constance will ask more questions than any of the examining seraphs.' "'Can't we do something?' she persisted tearfully, "'as Esme canted easily along in front of our tired horses. "'Personally,' I was doing everything that occurred to me at the moment. I stormed and scolded and coaxed in English and French and gamekeeper language. I made absurd, ineffectual cuts in the air with my thongless hunting crop, and hurled my sandwich case at the brute. In fact, I really don't know what more I could have done. And still we lumbered on through the deepening dusk, with that dark, uncouth shape lumbering ahead of us, and a drone of lugubrious music floating in our ears. Suddenly, as me bounded aside in some thick bushes, where we could not follow, the wail rose to a shriek, and then stopped altogether. This part of the story I always hurry over, because it is really rather horrible. When the beast joined us again, after an absence of a few minutes, there was an air of patient understanding about him, 
as though he knew that he had done something of which we disapproved, but which he felt to be thoroughly justifiable. "'How can you let that ravening beast trot by your side?' asked Constance. She was looking more than ever like an albino beetroot. "'In the first place, I can't prevent it,' I said. "'In the second place, whatever else he may be, "'I doubt if he's ravening at the present moment.' Constance shuddered. "'Do you think the poor little thing suffered much?' "'came another of her futile questions. "'The indications were all that way,' I said. "'On the other hand, of course, it may have been crying from sheer temper. Children sometimes do. It was nearly pitch dark when he emerged suddenly into the high road. A flash of lights and a whir of a motor went past us at the same moment as uncomfortably close quarters. A thud and a sharp screeching yell followed a second later. The car drew up, and when I had ridden back to the spot, I found a young man bending over a dark, motionless mass lying by the roadside. "'You have killed my Esme!' I exclaimed bitterly. "'I'm so awfully sorry,' said the young man. "'I keep dogs myself, so I know what you must feel about it. I'll do anything I can in reparation.' "'Please bury him at once,' I said. That much, I think, I may ask of you. Bring the spade, William, he called to a chauffeur. Evidently, hasty roadside internments were contingencies that had been provided against. The digging of a sufficiently large grave took some little time. I say, what a magnificent fellow, said the motorist, as the corpse was rolled over into the trench. I'm afraid he must have been rather a valuable admiral. He took second in the puppy class at Birmingham last year, I said resolutely. Constance snorted loudly. Don't cry, dear, I said brokenly. It was all over in a moment. He couldn't have suffered much. Look here, said the young fellow desperately. You simply must let me do something by way of reparation. I refused sweetly. But as he persisted, I let him have my address. Of course, we kept our own counsel as to the earlier episodes of the evening. Lord Pabham never advertised the loss of his hyena. When a strictly fruit-eating animal strayed from his park a year or two previously, he was called upon to give compensation in eleven cases of sheep worrying, and practically to restock his neighbor's poultry yards and an escaped hyena would mount up to something on the scale of a government grant. The gypsies were equally unobtrusive over their missing offspring. I don't suppose in large encampments they really know to a child or two how many they've got. The baroness paused reflectively, and then continued, There was a sequel to the adventure, though. I got through the post a charming little diamond bridge, with the name Esme set in a sprig of rosemary. Incidentally, too, I lost the friendship of Constance Brobble. You see, when I sold the brooch, I quite properly refused to give her any share of the proceeds. I pointed out that the Esme part of the affair was my own invention, and the hyena part of it belonged to Lord Pabham, if it really was his hyena, of which, of course, I have no proof. Hmm. That concludes the reading of Esme from the Chronicles of Clovis by Saki H. H. Munro Read by Ian Bartholomew Taipei, Taiwan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read and recorded by Ted McElroy, Austin, Texas the Last Leaf by O. Henry In a little district west of Washington Square, the streets have run crazy and broken themselves into small strips called places. 
These places make strange angles and curves. One street crosses itself a time or two. An artist once discovered a valuable possibility in this street. Suppose a collector with a bill for paints, paper, and canvas should, in traversing this route, suddenly meet himself coming back without a cent having been paid on account. So to quaint old Greenwich Village the art people soon came prowling, hunting for north windows and eighteenth-century gables and Dutch attics and low rents. Then they imported some pewter mugs and a chafing dish or two from Sixth Avenue and became a colony. At the top of a squatty three-story brick Sue and Johnsy had their studio. Johnsy was familiar for Joanna. One was from Maine, the other from California. They had met at the table d'hote of an Eighth Street Delmonico's and found their tastes in art, chicory salad, and bishop sleeves so congenial that the joint studio resulted. That was in May. In November, a cold, unseen stranger whom the doctors called pneumonia, stalked about the colony, touching one here and there with his icy fingers. Over on the east side, this ravager strode boldly, smiting his victims by scores, but his feet trod slowly through the maze of the narrow and moss-grown places. Mr. Pneumonia was not what you would call a chivalric old gentleman. A mite of a little woman with blood thinned by California's zephyrs was hardly fair game for the red-fisted, short-breathed old duffer. But John Z. he smote, and she lay scarcely moving on her painted iron bedstead, looking through the small Dutch window panes at the blank side of the next brick house. One morning the busy doctor invited Sue into the hallway with a shaggy gray eyebrow. She has one chance in, let us say, ten, he said, as he shook down the mercury in his clinical thermometer. And that chance is for her to want to live. This way people have of lining up on the side of the undertaker makes the entire pharmacopoeia look silly. Your little lady has made up her mind that she's not going to get well. Has she anything on her mind? She... She wanted to paint the Bay of Naples some day, said Sue. Paint? Bosh! Has she anything on her mind worth thinking twice? A man, for instance? A man, said Sue, with a Jew's harp twang in her voice, is a man worth... But no, doctor, there is nothing of the kind. Well, it is the weakness, then, said the doctor. I will do all that science, so far as it may filter through my efforts, can accomplish. But whenever my patient begins to count the carriages in her funeral procession, I subtract fifty percent from the curative power of medicines. If you'll get her to ask one question about the new winter styles in cloak sleeves, I will promise you a one in five chance for her, instead of one in ten. After the doctor had gone, Sue went into the workroom and cried a Japanese napkin to a pulp. Then she swaggered into Johnsy's room with her drawing board, whistling ragtime. Johnsy lay, scarcely making a ripple under the bedclothes, with her face toward the window. Sue stopped whistling, thinking she was asleep. She arranged her board and began a pen-and-ink drawing to illustrate a magazine story. Young artists must pave their way to art by drawing pictures for magazine stories that young authors write to pave their way to literature. As Sue was sketching a pair of elegant horse show riding trousers and a monocle of the figure of the hero, an Idaho cowboy, she heard a low sound several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. Johnsy's eyes were open wide. She was looking out the window and counting, counting backward. Twelve, she said, and a little later, eleven, and then ten, and nine, and then eight, and seven, almost together. Sue looked solicitously out of the window, 
what was there to count? There was only a bare, dreary yard to be seen, and the blank side of the brick house twenty feet away. An old, old ivy vine, gnarled and decayed at the roots, climbed halfway up the brick wall. The cold breath of autumn had stricken its leaves from the vine, until its skeleton branches clung almost bare to the crumbling bricks. "'What is it, dear?' asked Sue. Six, said Johnsy, in almost a whisper. "'They're falling faster now. Three days ago there were almost a hundred. It made my head ache to count them, but now it's easy. There goes another one. There are only five left now.' Five what, dear? Tell your sooty. "'Leaves, on the ivy vine. When the last one falls, I must go too. I've known that for three days.' "'Didn't the doctor tell you?' "'Oh, I've never heard of such nonsense,' complained Sue, with magnificent scorn. "'What have old ivy leaves to do with your getting well? "'And you used to love that vine so, you naughty girl. "'Don't be a goosey. "'Why, the doctor told me this morning that your chances for getting well real soon were—' "'Let's see exactly what he said. "'He—he he said the chances were ten to one. "'Why—' "'That's almost as good as a chance as we have in New York "'when we ride in the streetcars or walk past a new building. "'Try to take some broth now and let Sudi go back to her drawing "'so she can sell the editor man with it "'and buy port wine for her sick child "'and pork chops for her greedy self.' "'You needn't get any more wine,' said Johnsy, "'keeping her eyes fixed out the window. "'There goes another. "'No, I don't want any broth.' That leaves just four. I want to see the last one fall before it gets dark. Then I'll go, too. Johnsy, dear, said Sue, bending over her, will you promise me to keep your eyes closed and not look out that window until I'm done working? I must hand these drawings in by tomorrow. I need the light, or I'd draw the shade down. Couldn't you draw in the other room? asked Johnsy coldly. "'I'd rather be here by you,' said Sue. "'Besides, I don't want you to keep looking at those silly ivy leaves.' "'Tell me as soon as you've finished,' said Johnsy, "'closing her eyes and lying white and still as a fallen statue, "'because I want to see the last one fall. "'I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of thinking. "'I want to turn loose my hold on everything "'and go sailing down, down.' just like one of those poor tired leaves. "'Try to sleep,' said Sue. "'I must call Behrman up to be my model for the old hermit miner. "'I'll not be gone a minute. "'Don't try to move till I come back.' Old Behrman was a painter who lived on the ground floor beneath them. He was past sixty and had a Michelangelo's Moses beard curling down from the head of a satyr along with the body of an imp. Behrman was a failure in art. Forty years he had wielded the brush without getting near enough to touch the hem of his mistress's robe. He had been always about to paint a masterpiece, but had never yet begun it. For several years he had painted nothing except now and then a daub in the line of commerce or advertising. He earned a little by serving as a model to those young artists in the colony who could not pay the price of a professional. He drank gin to excess, and still talked of his coming masterpiece. For the rest, he was a fierce little old man, who scoffed terribly at softness in any one, and who regarded himself as a special mastiff-in-waiting to protect the two young artists in the studio above. Sue found Behrman smelling strongly of juniper berries in his dimly lighted den below. In one corner was a blank canvas on an easel that had been waiting there for twenty-five years to receive the first line of the masterpiece. She told him of Johnsy's fancy, and how she feared she would, indeed, light and fragile as a leaf herself, float away when her slight hold upon the world grew weaker. Old Behrman, with his red eyes plainly streaming, shouted his contempt and derision for such idiotic imaginings. "'Was!' he cried. 
Is there people in the world meant foolishness to die because leaves they drop off from a confounded vine? I have not heard of such a thing. No, I will not boast as a model for your fool hermit dunderhead. Why do you allow that silly business to come in the brain of her? Ah, that poor little Miss Yancey! She's very ill and weak, said Sue, and the fever has left her mind morbid and full of strange fancies. Very well, Mr. Behrman, if you do not care to pose for me, you needn't, but I think you are an horrid old flipperty gibbet. You are just like a woman, yelled Behrman. Who said I will not pose? Go on, I commit you. For half an hour I have been trying to say that I am ready to pose. God, is there not any place which one so good as Miss Johnsey shall lie sick? Some day I will paint a masterpiece, and we shall all go away. God, yes. Johnsey was sleeping when they went upstairs. Sue pulled the shade down to the window sill and motioned Behrman into the other room. In there they peered out the window fearfully at the ivy vine. Then they looked at each other for a moment without speaking. A persistent cold rain was falling mingled with snow. Behrman, in his old blue shirt, took his seat as the hermit miner on an upturned kettle for a rock. When Sue awoke from an hour's sleep the next morning, she found Johnsy with dull, wide-open eyes staring at the drawn green shade. "'Pull it up. I want to see,' she ordered in a whisper. Wearily, Sue obeyed. But lo! After the beating rain and the fierce gusts of wind that had endured through the live-long night, there yet stood out against the brick wall one ivy leaf. It was the last one on the vine. Still dark green near its stem, with its serrated edges tinted with the yellow of dissolution and decay, it hung bravely from the branch some twenty feet above the ground. "'It is the last one,' said Johnsy. "'I thought it would surely fall during the night. I heard the wind. It will fall today, and I shall die at the same time.' "'Dear, dear,' said Sue, leaning her worn face down to the pillow. "'Think of me, if you won't think of yourself. What would I do?' But Johnsy did not answer. The lonesomest thing in all the world is a soul when it is making ready to go on its mysterious far journey. The fancy seemed to possess her more strongly, as one by one the ties that bound her to friendship and to the earth were loosed.' The day wore away, and even through the twilight they could see the lone ivy leaf clinging to its stem against the wall, and then with the coming of the night the north wind was again loosed, while the rain still beat against the windows and pattered down from the low Dutch eaves. When it was light enough, John Z. the Merciless commanded that the shade be raised. The ivy leaf was still there. Johnsy lay for a long time looking at it. And then she called to Sue, who was stirring her chicken broth over the gas stove. "'I've been a bad girl, Sudi said Johnsy. "'Something has made that last leaf stay there to show me how wicked I was. "'It is a sin to want to die. "'You may bring me a little broth now, and some milk with a little port in it, and... "'No, bring me the hand-mirror first and then pack some pillows about me, and I'll sit up and watch you cook. An hour later she said, Sooty, some day I hope to paint the Bay of Naples. The doctor came in the afternoon, and Sue had an excuse to go into the hallway as he left. Even chances, said the doctor, taking Sue's thin, shaking hand in his, with good nursing you'll win. And now I must see another case I have downstairs. Behrman, his name is, some kind of artist, I believe. Pneumonia, too. He is an old, weak man, and the attack is acute. There is no hope for him. But he goes to the hospital today to be made more comfortable. The next day, the doctor said to Sue, She's out of danger. You won. Nutrition and care now, that's all. 
and that afternoon Sue came to the bed where John Z lay, contentedly knitting a very blue and very useless woolen shoulder scarf, and put one arm around her, pillows and all. "'I have something to tell you, White Mouse,' she said. "'Mr. Behrman died of pneumonia today in the hospital. He was ill only two days. The janitor found him in the morning of the first day in his room downstairs, helpless with pain.' His shoes and clothing were wet through and icy cold. They couldn't imagine where he had been on such a dreadful night. And then they found a lantern, still lighted, and a ladder that had been dragged from its place, and some scattered brushes, and a pallet with green and yellow colors mixed on it, and... Look out the window, dear, at the last ivy leaf on the wall. Didn't you wonder why it never fluttered or moved when the wind blew? Ah, darling... It's Behrman's masterpiece. He painted it there, the night the last leaf fell. End of The Last Leaf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Read and recorded by Ted Hanley. Seattle, Washington, February 2006. The Little Match Girl, also known as The Little Match Seller, by Hans Christian Andersen, 1846. It was the last evening of the year. In the cold and darkness, a poor little girl, with bare head and feet, was wandering about the streets. Her feet were quite red and blue with the cold. In her tattered apron she carried a bundle of matches, and there were a good many more in her hand. No one had bought any of them the livelong day. No one had given her a single penny. Trembling with cold and hunger, she crept on, the picture of sorrow. The snowflakes settled on her long, fair hair, which fell in ringlets over her shoulders, but she thought neither of her own beauty nor of the cold. Lights shone from every window, and the smell of roast goose reached her, for it was New Year's Eve, and it was of that she thought. In a corner formed by two houses, one of which came a little farther forward than the other, she sat down, drawing her feet close under her, but in vain she could not warm them. She dared not go home. She had sold no matches, earned not a single penny, and her father would certainly beat her. Besides, her home was almost as cold as the street. It was an attic, and although the larger of many holes in the roof were stopped up with straw and rags, the cold wind came whistling through. Her hands were nearly frozen. A match would warm them, perhaps, if she dared to light it. She drew one out and struck it against the wall. It was a bright, warm light, like a little candle, and she held her hands over it. It was quite a wonderful light. It seemed to that poor little girl as though she were sitting before a large iron stove with polished brass feet in brass ornaments. So beautifully did the fire within burn that the child stretched out her feet to warm them also. Alas, in the instant the flame had died away, and the stove vanished, and the little girl sat cold and comfortless, with the remains of the burnt match in her hand. A second match was struck. It kindled and blazed, and wherever its light fell, the wall became transparent as a veil, and the little girl could see into the room. She saw a table spread with a snowy white tablecloth and set with shining china dinner dishes. A roast goose, stuffed with apples and dried plums, stood at one end, smoking hot, and pleasantest of all to see, the goose, with knife and fork still in her breast, jumped down from the dish and waddled along the floor right up to the poor child. The match was burnt out, and only the thick, hard wall was beside her. 
she lighted a third match. Again the flame shot up, and now she was sitting under a most beautiful Christmas tree, far larger and far more prettily decked out than the last one she had seen last Christmas Eve through the glass doors of the rich merchant's house. Thousands of wax tapers lighted up the branches in tiny painted figures such as she had seen in the shop windows looked down from the tree upon her. The child stretched out her hands toward them and the match went out. Still, however, the Christmas candles burned higher and higher till they looked to her like the stars in the sky. One of them fell, the light streaming behind it like a long fiery tail. Now someone is dying, said the little girl softly, for she had been told by her old grandmother, the only person who had been kind to her, but she was now dead, that whenever a star falls, a soul flies up to God. She struck another match against the wall, and the light shone around her, and in its brightness she saw her dear dead grandmother, gentle and loving as always, but bright and happy as she had never looked during her lifetime. Grandmother, said the child, oh, take me with you. I know you will leave me as soon as the match goes out. You will vanish, like the warm stove, like the New Year's feast, and like the beautiful Christmas tree. And she hastily lighted all the remaining matches in the bundle, lest her grandmother should disappear. And the matches burned with such a splendor that noonday could scarcely have been brighter. Never had the good old grandmother looked so tall and stately, so beautiful and kind. She took the little girl into her arms, and they both flew away together, radiant with happiness. They flew far above the earth, higher and higher, till they were in that place where neither cold, nor hunger, nor pain is ever known in the presence of God. But in the cold morning air, crouching in the corner of the wall, the poor little girl was found, her cheeks glowing, her lips smiling, frozen to death on the last night of the old year. The New Year's sun shone on the lifeless child. Motionless, she sat there, with the matches in her lap, one bundle of them quite burnt out. She'd been trying to warm herself, the poor thing, some people said, but no one knew of the sweet visions she had beheld, or how gloriously she and her grandmother were celebrating their New Year's festival. End of the Little Match This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by William Kuhn, February 2006. Marjorie Daw by Thomas Bailey Aldrich. 1. Dr. Dillon to Edward Delaney, Esquire, at the Pines, near Rye, New Hampshire, August 8, 1872. My dear sir, I am happy to assure you that your anxiety is without reason. Fleming will be confined to the sofa for three or four weeks, and will have to be careful at first how he uses his leg. A fracture of this kind is always a tedious affair. Fortunately, the bone was very skillfully set by the surgeon who chanced to be in the drug store where Fleming was brought after his fall, and I apprehend no permanent inconvenience from the accident. Fleming is doing perfectly well physically, but I must confess that the irritable and morbid state of mind into which he has fallen causes me a great deal of uneasiness. He is the last man in the world who ought to break his leg. You know how impetuous our friend is ordinarily. What a soul of restlessness and energy, never content unless he is rushing at some object like a sportive bull at a red shawl, but amiable withal. He is no longer amiable. His temper has become something frightful. Miss Fanny Fleming came up from Newport, where the family are staying for the summer, to nurse him. But he packed her off the next morning in tears. He has a complete set of Balzac's works, 
twenty-seven volumes, piled up near his sofa, to throw at Watkins whenever that exemplary serving man appears with his meals. Yesterday I very innocently brought Fleming a small basket of lemons. You know it was a strip of lemon peel on the curbstone that caused our friend's mischance. Well, he no sooner set his eyes upon those lemons than he fell into such a rage as I cannot adequately describe. This is only one of his moods, and the least distressing. At other times he sits with bowed head, regarding his splintered limb, silent, sullen, despairing. When this fit is on him, and it sometimes lasts all day, nothing can distract his melancholy. He refuses to eat, does not even read the newspapers. Books, except as projectiles for Watkins, have no charms for him. His state is truly pitiable. Now, if he were a poor man with a family depending on his daily labor, this irritability and despondency would be natural enough. But in a young fellow of twenty-four, with plenty of money and seemingly not a care in the world, the thing is monstrous. If he continues to give way to his vagaries in this manner, he will end by bringing on an inflammation of the fibula. It was the fibula he broke. I am at my wit's end to know what to prescribe for him. I have anesthetics and lotions to make people sleep and to soothe pain, but I've no medicine that will make a man have a little common sense. That is beyond my skill. But maybe it is not beyond yours. You are Fleming's intimate friend, his fetus Acates. Write to him, write to him frequently, distract his mind, cheer him up, and prevent him from becoming a confirmed case of melancholia. Perhaps he has some important plans disarranged by his present confinement. If he has, you will know, and will know how to advise him judiciously. I trust your father finds the change beneficial? I am, my dear sir, with greatest respect, etc. 2. Edward Delaney to John Fleming, West 38th Street, New York, August ninth, 1872. My dear Jack, I had a line from Dylan this morning, and was rejoiced to learn that your hurt is not so bad as reported. Like a certain personage, you are not so black and blue as you are painted. Dylan will put you on your pins again in two to three weeks, if you will only have patience and follow his counsels. Did you get my note of last Wednesday? I was greatly troubled when I heard of the accident. I can imagine how tranquil and saintly you are with your leg in a trough. It is deuced awkward, to be sure, just as we had promised ourselves a glorious month together at the seaside. But we must make the best of it. It is unfortunate, too, that my father's health renders it impossible for me to leave him. I think he has much improved. The sea air is his native element. But he still needs my arm to lean upon in his walks, and requires someone more careful than a servant to look after him. I cannot come to you, dear Jack, but I have hours of unemployed time on hand, and I will write you a whole post office full of letters, if that will divert you. Heaven knows I haven't anything to write about. It isn't as if we were living at one of the beach houses. Then I could do you some character studies, and fill your imagination with groups of sea goddesses, with their, or somebody else's, raven and blonde manes hanging down their shoulders. You should have Aphrodite in morning wrapper, in evening costume, and in her prettiest bathing suit. But we are far from all that here. We have rooms in a farmhouse, on a crossroad, two miles from the hotels, and lead the quietest of lives. I wish I were a novelist. This old house with its sanded floors and high wainscots, and its narrow windows looking out upon a cluster of pines that turn themselves into aeolian harps every time the wind blows, would be the place in which to write a summer romance. It should be a story with the odors of the forest and the breath of the sea in it. It should be a novel like one of that Russian fellow's, what's his name? Turgenev, 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 Turgenev. Nobody knows how to spell him. Yet I wonder if even Eliza or an Alexandra Pavlovna could stir the heart of a man who has constant twinges in his leg. I wonder if one of our own Yankee girls of the best type, haughty and spirituelle, would be of any comfort to you in your present deplorable condition. 
If I thought so, I would hasten down to the surf house and catch one for you. Or, better still, I would find you one over the way. Picture to yourself a large white house just across the road, nearly opposite our cottage. It is not a house, but a mansion, built, perhaps, in the colonial period, with rambling extensions and gambrel roof and a wide piazza on three sides, a self-possessed, high-bred piece of architecture with its nose in the air. It stands back from the road and has an obsequious retinue of fringed elms and oaks and weeping willows. Sometimes, in the morning, and oftener in the afternoon, when the sun has withdrawn from that part of the mansions, a young woman appears on the piazza with some mysterious Penelope web of embroidery in her hand, or a book. There is a hammock over there, of pineapple fiber it looks from here. A hammock is very becoming when one is eighteen, and has golden hair, and dark eyes, and an emerald-colored illusion dress looped up after the fashion of a Dresden china shepherdess, and is chaussé, like a bell of the time of Louis Couture's. All this splendor goes into that hammock, and sways there like a pond lily in the golden afternoon. The window of my bedroom looks down on that piazza, and so do I. But enough of the nonsense, which ill becomes a sedate young attorney taking his vacation with an invalid father. Drop me a line, dear Jack, and tell me how you really are. State your case. Write me a long, quiet letter. If you are violent or abusive, I'll take the law to you. 3. John Fleming to Edward Delaney, August 11th, 1872. Your letter, dear Ned, was a godsend. Fancy what a fix I am in. I, who never had a day's sickness since I was born. My left leg weighs three tons. It is embalmed in spices and smothered in layers of fine linen, like a mummy. I can't move. I haven't moved for five thousand years. I'm of the time of Pharaoh. I lie from morning till night on a lounge, staring into the hot street. Everybody is out of town enjoying himself. The brownstone front houses across the street resemble a row of particularly ugly coffins set up on end. A green mold is settling on the names of the deceased, carved on the silver door plates. Sardonic spiders have sewn up the keyholes. All is silence and dust and desolation. I interrupt this a moment to take a shy at Watkins, with the second volume of César Birateau, Missed him. I think I could bring him down with a copy of St. Beuve or the Dictionnaire Universel if I had it. These small Balzac books somehow do not quite fit my hand. But I shall fetch him yet. I have an idea that Watkins is tapping the old gentleman's Chateau Ikem, duplicate key of the wine cellar, Hibernian soirees in the front basement, young Cheops upstairs snug in his cerements. Watkins glides into my chamber with that colorless, hypocritical face of his drawn out like an accordion. But I know he grins all the way down the stairs, and is glad I have broken my leg. Was not my evil star in the very zenith when I ran up to town to attend that dinner at Delmonico's? I didn't come up altogether for that. It was partly to buy Frank Livingston's roan mare, Margot. And now I shall not be able to sit in the saddle these two months." I'll send the mare down to you at the Pines. Is that the name of the place? Old Dillon fancies that I have something on my mind. He drives me wild with lemons. Lemons for a mind diseased. Nonsense. I am only as restless as the devil under this confinement. A thing I'm not used to. Take a man who has never had so much as a headache or a toothache in his life. Strap one of his legs in a section of water spout. Keep him in a room in the city for weeks with the hot weather turned on, and then expect him to smile and purr and be happy? It is preposterous. I can't be cheerful or calm. Your letter is the first consoling thing I have had since my disaster ten days ago. It really cheered me up for half an hour. Send me a screed, Ned, as often as you can, if you love me. Anything will do. Write me more about that little girl in the hammock. 
That was very pretty, all that about the Dresden China Shepherdess and the Pond Lily. The imagery a little mixed, perhaps, but very pretty. I didn't suppose you had so much sentimental furniture in your upper story. It shows how one may be familiar for years with the reception room of his neighbor, and never suspect what is directly under his mansard. I supposed your loft stuffed with dry legal parchments, mortgages, and affidavits. You take down a package of manuscript, and lo, there are lyrics and sonnets and cansonettas. You really have a graphic descriptive touch, Edward Delaney, and I suspect you of anonymous love tales in the magazines. I shall be a bear until I hear from you again. Tell me all about your pretty inconnue across the road. What is her name? Who is she? Who is her father? Where is her mother? Who's her lover? You cannot imagine how this will occupy me. The more trifling, the better. My imprisonment has weakened me intellectually to such a degree that I find your epistolary gifts quite considerable. I am passing into my second childhood. In a week or two I shall take to India rubber rings and prongs of coral. A silver cup with an appropriate inscription would be a delicate attention on your part. In the meantime, write. 4. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 12, 1872. The sick Pasha shall be amused. Bismala, he wills it so. If the storyteller becomes prolix and tedious, the bowstring and the sack, and two Nubians to drop him into the Piscataqua. But truly, Jack, I have a hard task. There is literally nothing here, except the little girl over the way. She is swinging in the hammock at this moment. It is to me compensation for many of the ills of life to see her now and then put out a small kid boot, which fits like a glove, and set herself going. Who is she, and what is her name? Her name is Daw, only daughter of Mr. Richard W. Daw, ex-colonel and banker, mother dead, one brother at Harvard, elder brother killed at the Battle of Fair Oaks ten years ago, old, rich family, the Daws. This is the homestead where father and daughter pass eight months of the twelve. The rest of the year in Baltimore and Washington. The New England winter too many for the old gentleman. The daughter is called Marjorie, Marjorie Daw. Sounds odd at first, doesn't it? But after you say it over to yourself half a dozen times, you like it. There's a pleasing quaintness to it, something prim and violet-like. Must be a nice sort of girl to be called Marjorie Daw. I had mine host of the Pines in the witness box last night, and drew the foregoing testimony from him. He has charge of Mr. Daw's vegetable garden, and has known the family these thirty years. Of course I shall make the acquaintance of my neighbors before many days. It will be next to impossible for me not to meet Mr. Daw or Miss Daw in some of my walks. The young lady has a favorite path to the sea beach. I shall intercept her one morning and touch my hat to her. Then the princess will bend her fair head to me with courteous surprise, not unmixed with haughtiness. Will snub me, in fact. All this for thy sake, O Pasha of the snapped axle-tree. How oddly things fall out. Ten minutes ago I was called down to the parlor. You know, the kind of parlors and farmhouses on the coast. A sort of amphibious parlor, with seashells on the mantelpiece, and spruce branches in the chimney-place where I found my father and Mr. Daw doing the antique polite to each other. He had come to pay his respects to his new neighbors. Mr. Daw is a tall, slim gentleman of about forty-five, with a florid face and snow-white mustache and side-whiskers. Looks like Mr. Dombey, or as Mr. Dombey would have looked if he had served a few years in the British Army. Mr. Daw was a colonel in the late war, commanding the regiment in which his son was a lieutenant. Plucky old boy, backbone of New Hampshire granite. Before taking his leave, the colonel delivered himself of an invitation as if he were issuing a general order. Miss Daw has a few friends coming at 4 p.m. to play croquet on the lawn, parade ground, and have tea, cold rations, on the piazza. Will we honor them with our company, or be sent to the guardhouse? My father declines on the plea of ill health. My father's son bows with as much suavity as he knows, and accepts. In my next, I shall have something to tell you. I shall have seen the little beauty face to face. 
I have a presentiment, Jack, that this daw is a rara avis. Keep up your spirits, my boy, until I write you another letter, and send me a long word how's your leg. 5. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August 13th, 1872. The party, my dear Jack, was as dreary as possible. A lieutenant of the Navy, the rector of the Episcopal Church at Stillwater, and a society swell from Nahant. The lieutenant looked as if he had swallowed a couple of his buttons, and found the bullion rather indigestible. The rector was a pensive youth, of the Daffy Down Dilly sort, and the swell from Nahant was a very weak tidal wave indeed. The women were much better, as they always are. The two Miss Kingsburys of Philadelphia, staying at the Seashell House, two bright and engaging girls. But Marjorie Daw! The company broke up soon after tea, and I remained to smoke a cigar with the colonel on the piazza. It was like seeing a picture to see Miss Marjorie hovering around the old soldier and doing a hundred gracious little things for him. She brought the cigars and lighted the tapers with her own delicate fingers in the most enchanting fashion. As we sat there, she came and went in the summer twilight and seemed, with her white dress and pale gold hair, like some lovely phantom that had sprung into existence out of the smoke wreaths. If she had melted into air, like the statue of Galatea in the play, I should have been more sorry than surprised. It was easy to perceive that the old colonel worshipped her and she him. I think the relation between an elderly father and a daughter just blooming into womanhood the most beautiful possible. There is in it a subtle sentiment that cannot exist in the case of mother and daughter, or that of son and mother. But this is getting into deep water. I sat with the Dawes until half-past ten, and saw the moon rise on the sea. The ocean, that had stretched motionless and black against the horizon, was changed by magic into a broken field of glittering ice, interspersed with marvelous silvery fjords. In the far distance the Isle of Shoals loomed up like a group of huge bergs drifting down on us. The polar regions in a June thaw. It was exceedingly fine. What did we talk about? We talked about the weather. And you. The weather has been disagreeable for several days past, and so have you. I glided from one topic to the other very naturally. I told my friends of your accident, how it had frustrated all our summer plans, and what our plans were. I played quite a spirited solo on the fibula. Then I described you. Or rather, I didn't. I spoke of your amiability, of your patience under this severe affliction, of your touching gratitude when Dylan brings you little presents of fruit, of your tenderness to your sister Fanny, whom you would not allow to stay in town to nurse you, and how you heroically sent her back to Newport, preferring to remain alone with Mary the cook and your man Watkins, to whom, by the way, you were devotedly attached. If you had been there, Jack, you wouldn't have known yourself. I should have excelled as a criminal lawyer if I had not turned my attention to a different branch of jurisprudence. Miss Marjorie asked all manner of leading questions concerning you. It did not occur to me then, but it struck me forcibly afterwards that she evinced a singular interest in the conversation. When I got back to my room, I recalled how eagerly she leaned forward, with her full snowy throat in strong moonlight, listening to what I said. Positively, I think I made her like you. Miss Daw is a girl whom you would like immensely, I can tell you that. A beauty without affectation, a high and tender nature, if one can read the soul in the face. And the old colonel is a noble character, too. I am glad that the Dawes are such pleasant people. The Pines is an isolated spot, and my resources are few. I fear I should have found life here somewhat monotonous before long, with no other society than that of my excellent sire. It is true, I might have made a target of the defenseless invalid, but I haven't a taste for artillery, moi. 6. John Fleming to Edward Delaney, August 17th, 1872. For a man who hasn't a taste of artillery, it occurs to me, my friend, you are keeping up a pretty lively fire on my inner works. But go on. Cynicism is a small brass field piece that eventually bursts and kills the artilleryman. 
You may abuse me as much as you like, and I'll not complain, for I don't know what I should do without your letters. They are curing me. I haven't hurled anything at Watkin since last Sunday, partly because I have grown more amiable under your teaching, and partly because Watkins captured my ammunition one night and carried it off to the library. He is rapidly losing the habit he had acquired of dodging whenever I rub my ear or make any slight motion with my right arm. He is still suggestive of the wine cellar, however. You may break, you may shatter Watkins if you will, but the scent of the redderer will hang around him still. Ned, that Miss Daw must be a charming person. I should certainly like her. I like her already. When you spoke in your first letter of seeing a young girl swinging in a hammock under your chamber window, I was somehow strangely drawn to her. I cannot account for it in the least. What you have subsequently written of Miss Daw has strengthened the impression. You seem to be describing a woman I have known in some previous state of existence, or dreamed of in this. Upon my word, if you were to send me her photograph, I believe I should recognize her at a glance. Her manner, that listening attitude, her traits of character, as you indicate them, the light hair and the dark eyes, they are all familiar things to me. Asked a lot of questions, did she? Curious about me? That is strange. You would laugh in your sleeve, you wretched old cynic, if you knew how I lie awake nights with my gas turned down to a star, thinking of the pines and the house across the road. How cool it must be down there. I long for the salt smell in the air. I picture the colonel smoking his cheroot on the piazza. I send you and Miss Daw off on afternoon rambles along the beach. Sometimes I let you stroll with her under the elms in the moonlight, for you are great friends by this time, I take it, and see each other every day. I know your ways and your manners. Then I fall into a truculent mood and would like to destroy somebody. Have you noticed anything in the shape of a lover hanging around the Colonel Larry's and Penates? Does that lieutenant of the horse marines or that young Stillwater parson visit the house much? Not that I am pining for news of them, but any gossip of this kind would be in order. I wonder, Ned, you don't fall in love with Miss Daw. I am ripe to do it myself. Speaking of photographs, couldn't you manage to slip one of her carte de visite from her album? She must have an album, you know and send it to me? I will return it before it could be missed. That's a good fellow. Did the mare arrive safe and sound? It will be a capital animal this autumn for Central Park. Oh, my leg? I forgot about my leg. It's better. 7. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August twentieth, 1872. You are correct in your surmises. I am on the most friendly terms with our neighbors. The colonel and my father smoke their afternoon cigar together in our sitting room or on the piazza opposite, and I pass an hour or two of the day or the evening with the daughter. I am more and more struck by the beauty, modesty, and intelligence of Miss Daw. You ask me why I do not fall in love with her. I will be frank, Jack. I have thought of that. She is young, rich, accomplished, uniting in herself more attractions, mental and personal, than I can recall in any girl of my acquaintance. But she lacks the something that would be necessary to inspire in me that kind of interest. Possessing this unknown quality, a woman neither beautiful, nor wealthy, nor very young could bring me to her feet. But not Miss Daw. If we were shipwrecked together on an uninhabited island, let me suggest a tropical island, for it costs no more to be picturesque, I would build her a bamboo hut. I would fetch her breadfruit and coconuts. I would fry yams for her. I would lure the ingenuous turtle and make her nourishing soups. But I would not make love to her, not under eighteen months. I would like to have her for a sister, that I might shield her and counsel her, and spend half my income on old thread lace and camel's hair shawls. We are off the island now. If such were not my feeling, there would still be an obstacle to my loving Miss Daw. A greater misfortune could scarcely befall me than to love her. Fleming, I am about to make a revelation that will astonish you. I may be all wrong in my premises and consequently in my conclusions, but you shall judge. That night, when I returned to my room after the croquet party at the Daws, 
and was thinking over the trivial events of the evening, I was suddenly impressed by the air of eager attention with which Miss Daw had followed my account of your accident. I think I mentioned this to you. Well, the next morning, as I went to mail my letter, I overtook Miss Daw on the road to Rye, where the post office is, and accompanied her thither and back, an hour's walk. The conversation again turned to you, and again I remarked that inexplicable look of interest which had lighted up her face the previous evening. Since then, I have seen Miss Daw perhaps ten times, perhaps oftener, and on each occasion I found that when I was not speaking of you, or your sister, or some person or place associated with you, I was not holding her attention. She would be absent-minded, her eyes would wander away from me to the sea, or to some distant object in the landscape. Her fingers would play with the leaves of a book in a way that convinced me she was not listening. At these moments, if I abruptly changed the theme, I did it several times as an experiment, and dropped some remark about my friend Fleming, then the somber blue eyes would come back to me instantly. Now, is not this the oddest thing in the world? No, not the oddest. The effect which you tell me was produced on you by my casual mention of an unknown girl swinging in a hammock is certainly as strange. You can conjecture how that passage in your letter of Friday startled me. Is it possible, then, that two people who have never met and who are hundreds of miles apart can exert a magnetic influence on each other? I have read of such psychological phenomena, but never credited them. I leave the solution of the problem to you. As for myself, all other things being favorable, it would be impossible for me to fall in love with a woman who listens to me only when I am talking of my friend. I am not aware that any one is paying marked attention to my fair neighbor. The lieutenant of the Navy, he is stationed at Rivermouth, sometimes drops in of an evening, and sometimes the rector from Stillwater. The lieutenant, the oftener. He was there last night. I should not be surprised if he had an eye to the heiress. But he is not formidable. Mistress Daw carries a neat little spear of irony, and the honest lieutenant seems to have a particular facility for impaling himself on the point of it. He is not dangerous, I should say, though I have known a woman to satirize a man for years and marry him after all. Decidedly, the lowly rector is not dangerous. Yet again, who has not seen cloth of frieze victorious in the lists where cloth of gold went down? As to the photograph, there is an exquisite ivory type of Marjorie in Passepartout on the drawing-room mantelpiece. It would be missed at once if taken. I would do anything reasonable for you, Jack, but I've no burning desire to be hauled up before the local justice of the peace on a charge of petty larceny. P.S. Enclosed is a spray of mignonette, which I advise you to treat tenderly. Yes, we talked of you again last night, as usual. It is becoming a little dreary for me. 8. Edward Delaney to John Fleming, August twenty second, 1872 Your letter in reply to my last has occupied my thoughts all the morning. I do not know what to think. Do you mean to say that you are seriously half in love with a woman whom you have never seen, with a shadow, a chimera? For what else can Miss Daw be to you? I do not understand it at all. I understand neither you nor her. You are a couple of ethereal beings moving in finer air than I can breathe with my commonplace lungs. Such delicacy of sentiment is something that I admire without comprehending. I am bewildered. I am of the earth earthy, and I find myself in the incongruous position of having to do with mere souls, with natures so finely tempered that I run some risk of shattering them in my awkwardness. I am as Caliban among the spirits. Reflecting on your letter, I am not sure that it is wise in me to continue this correspondence. But no, Jack, I do wrong to doubt the good sense that forms the basis of your character. You are deeply interested in Miss Daw. You feel that she is a person whom you may perhaps greatly admire when you know her. At the same time, you bear in mind that the chances are ten to five that when you do come to know her, she will fall far short of your ideal, and you will not care for her in the least. Look at it in this sensible light, and I will hold back nothing from you. 
Yesterday afternoon, my father and myself rode over to Rivermouth with the Dawes. A heavy rain in the morning had cooled the atmosphere and laid the dust. To Rivermouth is a drive of eight miles along a winding road lined all the way with wild barberry bushes. I never saw anything more brilliant than these bushes, the green of the foliage and the faint blush of the berries intensified by the rain. The colonel drove, with my father in front, Miss Daw and I on the back seat. I resolved that for the first five miles your name should not pass my lips. I was amused by the artful attempts she made at the start to break through my reticence. Then a silence fell upon her, and then she became suddenly gay. That keenness which I enjoyed so much when it was exercised on the lieutenant was not so satisfactory directed against myself. Miss Daw has great sweetness of disposition, but she can be disagreeable. She is like the young lady in the rhyme, with the curl on her forehead. When she is good, she is very, very good. And when she is bad, she is horrid. I kept to my resolution, however. But on the return home I relented, and talked of your mare. Miss Daw is going to try a side-saddle on Margot some morning. The animal is a trifle too light for my weight. By the by, I nearly forgot to say that Miss Daw sat for a picture yesterday to a river-mouth artist. If the negative turns out well, I am to have a copy. So our ends will be accomplished without crime. I wish, though, I could send you the ivory type in the drawing-room. It is cleverly colored and would give you an idea of her hair and eyes, which, of course, the other will not. No, Jack, the spray of mignonette did not come from me. A man of twenty-eight doesn't enclose flowers in his letters, to another man. But don't attach too much significance to the circumstance. She gives sprays of mignonette to the rector, sprays to the lieutenant. She has even given a rose from her bosom to your slave. It is her jocund nature to scatter flowers, like spring. If my letters sometimes read disjointedly, you must understand that I never finish one in a sitting, but write at intervals, when the mood is on me. The mood is not on me now. 9. Edward Delaney to John Fleming, August 23rd, 1872. I have just returned from the strangest interview with Marjorie. She has all but confessed to me her interest in you. But with what modesty and dignity! Her words elude my pen as I attempt to put them on paper. And, indeed, it was not so much what she said as her manner, and that I cannot reproduce. Perhaps it was of a piece with the strangeness of this whole business that she should tacitly acknowledge to a third party the love she feels for a man she has never beheld. But I have lost, through your aid, the faculty of being surprised. I accept things as people do in dreams. Now that I am again in my room, it all appears like an illusion. The black masses of Rembrandtish shadow under the trees, the fireflies whirling in pyrrhic dances among the shrubbery, the sea over there, Marjorie sitting on the hammock. It is past midnight, and I am too sleepy to write more. Thursday morning. My father has suddenly taken it into his head to spend a few days at the Shoals. In the meanwhile, you will not hear from me. I see Marjorie walking in the garden with the colonel. I wish I could speak to her alone, but she'll probably not have an opportunity before we leave. 10. Edward Delaney to John Fleming, August 28, 1872. You were passing into your second childhood, were you? Your intellect was so reduced that my epistolary gifts seemed quite considerable to you, did they? I rise superior to the sarcasm in your favor of the eleventh instant, when I notice that five days' silence on my part is sufficient to throw you into the depths of despondency. We returned only this morning from Appledore, that enchanted island, at four dollars per day. I find on my desk three letters from you. Evidently there is no lingering doubt in your mind as to the pleasure I derive from your correspondence. These letters are undated, but in what I take to be the latest are two passages that require my consideration. You will pardon my candor, dear Fleming, but the conviction forces itself upon me that as your leg grows stronger, your head becomes weaker. You ask my advice on a certain point. I will give it. In my opinion, you could do nothing more unwise than to address a note to Miss Daw, thanking her for the flower. It would, I am sure, offend her delicacy beyond pardon, 
she knows you only through me. You are to her an abstraction, a figure in a dream, a dream from which the faintest shock would awaken her. Of course, if you enclose a note to me and insist on its delivery, I shall deliver it, but I advise you not to do so. You say you are able, with the aid of a cane, to walk about your chamber, and that you propose to come to the pines the instant Dylan thinks you strong enough to stand the journey. Again, I advise you not to. Do you not see that every hour you remain away, Marjorie's glamour deepens, and your influence over her increases? You will ruin everything by precipitancy. Wait until you are entirely recovered. In any case, do not come without giving me warning. I fear the effect of your abrupt advent here, under the circumstances. Miss Daw was evidently glad to see us back again, and gave me both hands in the frankest way. She stopped at the door a moment this afternoon in the carriage. She had been over to Rivermouth for her pictures. Unluckily, the photographer had spilt some acid on the plate, and she was obliged to give him another sitting. I have an intuition that something is troubling Marjorie. She had an abstracted air not usual with her. However, it may be only my fancy. I end this, leaving several things unsaid, to accompany my father on one of those long walks which are now his chief medicine, and mine. 11. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August ninth, 1872. I write in great haste to tell you what has taken place here since my letter of last night. I am in the utmost perplexity. Only one thing is plain. You must not dream of coming to the Pines. Marjorie has told her father everything. I saw her for a few minutes, an hour ago, in the garden, and, as near as I could gather from her confused statement, the facts are these. Lieutenant Bradley, that's the naval officer stationed at Rivermouth, has been paying court to Miss Daw for some time past, but not so much to her liking as to that of the colonel, who it seems is an old friend of the young gentleman's father. Yesterday, I knew she was in some trouble when she drove up to our gate. The colonel spoke to Marjorie of Bradley, urged his suit, I infer. Marjorie expressed her dislike for the lieutenant with characteristic frankness, and finally confessed to her father. Well, I really do not know what she confessed. It must have been the vaguest of confessions, and must have sufficiently puzzled the colonel. At any rate, it exasperated him. I suppose I am implicated in the matter, and that the colonel feels bitterly towards me. I do not see why. I have carried no messages between you and Miss Daw. I have behaved with the greatest discretion. I can find no flaw anywhere in my proceeding. I do not see that anybody has done anything, except the colonel himself. It is probable, nevertheless, that the friendly relations between the two houses will be broken off. A plague of both your houses, say you. I will keep you informed as well as I can of what occurs over the way. We shall remain here until the second week in September. Stay where you are, or at all events, do not dream of joining me. Colonel Daw is sitting on the piazza looking rather wicked. I have not seen Marjorie since I parted with her in the garden. 12. Edward Delaney to Thomas Dillon, M.D., Madison Square, New York, August thirtieth, 1872. My dear doctor, if you have any influence over Fleming, I beg of you to exert it to prevent his coming to this place at present. There are circumstances which I will explain to you before long that make it of the first importance that he should not come into this neighborhood. His appearance here, I speak advisedly, would be disastrous to him. In urging him to remain in New York or to go to some inland resort, you will be doing him and me a real service. Of course you will not mention my name in this connection. You know me well enough, my dear doctor, to be assured that, in begging your secret cooperation, I have reasons that will meet your entire approval when they are made plain to you. We shall return to town on the 15th of next month, and my first duty will be to present myself at your hospitable door and satisfy your curiosity, if I have excited it. My father, I am glad to state, has so greatly improved that he can no longer be regarded as an invalid. With great esteem, I am, etc., etc. 13. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. August thirty first, 1872. Your letter announcing your mad determination to come here has just reached me. I beseech you to reflect a moment. The step would be fatal to your interests and hers. You would furnish just cause for irritation to R.W.D., 
and, though he loves Marjorie devotedly, he is capable of going to any lengths if opposed. You would not like, I am convinced, to be the means of causing him to treat her with severity. That would be the result of your presence at the Pines at this juncture. I am annoyed to be obliged to point out these things to you. We are on very delicate ground, Jack. The situation is critical, and the slightest mistake in a move would cost us the game. If you consider it worth the winning, be patient. Trust a little to my sagacity. Wait and see what happens. Moreover, I understand from Dillon that you are in no condition to take so long a journey. He thinks the air of the coast would be the worst thing possible for you, that you ought to go inland, if anywhere. Be advised by me. Be advised by Dillon. 14. Telegrams. September 1st, 1872. 1. To Edward Delaney. Letter received. Dillon be hanged. I think I ought to be on the ground. J.F. 2. To John Fleming. Stay where you are. You would only complicate matters. Do not move until you hear from me. E.D. 3. To Edward Delaney. My being at the Pines could be kept a secret. I must see her. J.F. 4. To John Fleming. Do not think of it. It would be useless. R.W.D. has locked M. in her room. You would not be able to effect an interview. E.D. 5. To Edward Delaney. Locked her in her room? Good God! That settles the question. I shall leave by the 1215 Express. J.F. 15. The Arrival on the second day of September, 1872, as the Down Express, due at 3.40, left the station at Hampton, a young man, leaning on the shoulder of a servant, whom he addressed as Watkins, stepped from the platform into a hack and requested to be driven to the Pines. On arriving at the gate of a modest farmhouse a few miles from the station, the young man descended with difficulty from the carriage and, casting a hasty glance across the road, seemed much impressed by some peculiarity in the landscape. Again, leaning on the shoulder of the person Watkins, he walked to the door of the farmhouse and inquired for Mr. Edward Delaney. He was informed by the aged man who answered his knock that Mr. Edward Delaney had gone to Boston the day before, but that Mr. Jonas Delaney was within. This information did not appear satisfactory to the stranger, who inquired if Mr. Edward Delaney had left any message for Mr. John Fleming. There was a letter for Mr. Fleming if he were that person. After a brief absence, the aged man reappeared with a letter. 16. Edward Delaney to John Fleming. September 1st, 1872. I am horror-stricken at what I have done. When I began this correspondence, I had no other purpose than to relieve the tedium of your sick chamber. Dylan told me to cheer you up. I tried to. I thought that you entered into the spirit of the thing. I had no idea, until within a few days, that you were taking matters au grand sérieux. What can I say? I am in sackcloth and ashes. I am a pariah, a dog of an outcast. I tried to make a little romance to interest you, something soothing and idyllic, and, by Jove, I have done it only too well. My father doesn't know a word of this, so don't jar the old gentleman any more than you can help. I fly from the wrath to come, when you arrive. For, oh dear Jack, there isn't any piazza, there isn't any hammock, there isn't any Marjorie Daw. End of Marjorie Daw. LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Toys of Peace by Saki Read and recorded by Tay Jensen Harvey, said Eleanor Bope, handing her brother a cutting from a London morning paper of the 19th of March. Just read this about children's toys, please. It exactly carries out some of our ideas about influence and upbringing. In the view of the National Peace Council, ran the extract, there are grave objections to presenting our boys with regiments of fighting men, batteries of guns, and squadrons of dreadnoughts.
Boys, the Council admits, naturally love fighting and all the panoply of war, but that is no reason for encouraging and perhaps giving permanent form to their primitive instincts. At the Children's Welfare Exhibition, which opens at Olympia in three weeks' time, the Peace Council will make an alternative suggestion to parents in the shape of an exhibition of peace toys. In front of a specially painted representation of the Peace Palace at The Hague will be grouped not miniature soldiers, but miniature civilians, not guns, but ploughs and the tools of industry. It is hoped that manufacturers may take a hint from the exhibit, which will bear fruit in the toy shops. "'The idea is certainly an interesting and very well-meaning one,' said Harvey. "'Whether it would succeed well in practice—' "'We must try,' interrupted his sister. "'You are coming down to us at Easter, and you always bring the boys some toys, "'so that will be an excellent opportunity for you to inaugurate the new experiment. "'Go about in the shops and buy any little toys and models "'that have special bearing on civilian life in its more peaceful aspects. "'Of course, you must explain the toys to the children and interest them in the new idea. "'I regret to say that the Siege of Adrianople toy that their Aunt Susan sent them "'didn't need any explanation. "'They knew all the uniforms and flags and even the names of the respective commanders. "'And when I heard them one day using what seemed to be the most objectionable language, "'they said it was Bulgarian words of command. "'Of course, it may have been, but at any rate I took the toy away from them.' Now, I shall expect your Easter gifts to give quite a new impulse and direction to the children's minds. Eric is not eleven yet, and Bertie is only nine and a half, so they are really at a most impressionable age. There is primitive instinct to be taken into consideration, you know, said Harvey doubtfully, and hereditary tendencies as well. One of their great uncles fought in the most intolerant fashion at Inkerman. He was specially mentioned in dispatches, I believe, and their great-grandfather smashed all his Whig neighbours' hothouses when the Great Reform Bill was passed. Still, as you say, they are at an impressionable age. I will do my best. On Easter Saturday, Harvey Bope unpacked a large, promising-looking red cardboard box under the expectant eyes of his nephews. "'Your uncle has brought you the newest thing in toys,' Eleanor had said impressively, and youthful anticipation had been anxiously divided between Albanian soldiery and a Somali camel corps. Eric was hotly in favour of the latter contingency. "'There would be Arabs on horseback,' he whispered. "'The Albanians have got jolly uniforms, and they fight all day long, and all night too when there's a moon, but the country's rocky, so they've got no cavalry.' A quantity of crinkly paper shavings was the first thing that met the view when the lid was removed. The most exciting toys always began like that. Harvey pushed back the top layer and drew forth a square, rather featureless building. "'It's a fort!' exclaimed Bertie. "'It isn't. It's the Palace of the Impret of Albania.' said Eric, immensely proud of his knowledge of the exotic title. It's got no windows, you see, so that passers-by can't fire in at the royal family. It's a municipal dustbin, said Harvey hurriedly. You see, all the refuse and litter of a town is collected there instead of lying about and injuring the health of the citizens. In an awful silence, he disinterred a little lead figure of a man in black clothes. That, he said, is a distinguished civilian— John Stuart Mill. He was an authority on political economy. Why? asked Bertie. Well, he wanted to be. He thought it was a useful thing to be. Bertie gave an expressive grunt, which conveyed his opinion that there was no accounting for tastes. Another square building came out, this time with windows and chimneys. A model of the Manchester branch of the Young Women's Christian Association, said Harvey. "'Are there any lions?' asked Eric, hopefully. He had been reading Roman history, and thought that where you found Christians you might reasonably expect to find a few lions. "'There are no lions,' said Harvey. "'Here is another civilian, Robert Rakes, the founder of Sunday schools, and here is a model of a municipal wash-house. These little round things are loaves baked in a sanitary bakehouse. That lead figure is a sanitary inspector. This one is a district councillor, and this one is an official of the local government board.' "'What does he do?' asked Eric wearily. "'He sees to things connected with his department,' said Harvey. "'This box with a slit in it is a ballot-box. Votes are put into it at election times.' "'What is put into it at other times?' asked Bertie. "'Nothing. And here are some tools of industry, a wheelbarrow and a hoe, and I think these are meant for hop-poles. 
This is a model beehive, and that is a ventilator for ventilating sewers. This seems to be another municipal dustbin. No, it is a model of a school of art and public library. This little lead figure is Mrs. Hemans, a poetess, and that is Roland Hill, who introduced the system of penny postage. This is Sir John Herschel, the eminent astrologer. Are we to play with these civilian figures? asked Eric. Of course, said Harvey. These are toys. They are meant to be played with. But how? It was rather a poser. You might make two of them contest a seat in Parliament, said Harvey, and have an election with rotten eggs and free fights and ever so many broken heads, exclaimed Eric, and noses all bleeding and everybody drunk as can be, echoed Bertie, who had carefully studied one of Hogarth's pictures. Nothing of the kind, said Harvey. Nothing in the least like that. Votes will be put in the ballot box, and the mayor will count them, and he will say which has received the most votes, and then the two candidates will thank him for presiding, and each will say that the contest has been conducted throughout in the pleasantest and most straightforward fashion, and they part with expressions of mutual esteem. There's a jolly game for you boys to play. I never had such toys when I was young. I don't think we'll play with them just now said Eric, with an entire absence of the enthusiasm that his uncle had shown. I think perhaps we ought to do a little of our holiday task. It's history this time. We've got to learn up something about the Bourbon period in France. The Bourbon period, said Harvey, with some disapproval in his voice. We've got to know something about Louis the Fourteenth. continued Eric. I've learnt the names of all the principal battles already. This would never do. There were, of course, some battles fought during his reign, said Harvey, but I fancy the accounts of them were much exaggerated. News was very unreliable in those days, and there were practically no war correspondence, so generals and commanders could magnify every little skirmish they engaged until they reached the proportions of decisive battles. Louis was really famous now as a landscape gardener. The way he laid out Versailles was so much admired that it was copied all over Europe. "'Do you know anything about Madame du Barry?' asked Eric. "'Didn't she have her head chopped off?' "'She was another great lover of gardening,' said Harvey evasively. "'In fact, I believe the well-known Rose du Barry was named after her. "'And now I think you had better play for a little and leave your lessons till later.' Harvey retreated to the library and spent some thirty or forty minutes in wondering whether it would be possible to compile a history for use in elementary schools in which there should be no prominent mention of battles, massacres, murderous intrigues, and violent deaths. The York and Lancaster period and the Napoleonic era would, he admitted to himself, present considerable difficulties, and the Thirty Years' War would entail something of a gap if you left it out altogether. Still, it would be something gained if, at a highly impressionable age, children could be got to fix their attention on the invention of calico printing instead of the Spanish Armada or the Battle of Waterloo. It was time, he thought, to go back to the boys' room and see how they were getting on with their peace toys. As he stood outside the door, he could hear Eric's voice raised in command. Bertie chimed in now and again with a helpful suggestion. That is Louis the Fourteenth. Eric was saying. That one in knee breeches that Uncle said invented Sunday schools. It isn't a bit like him, but it'll have to do. We'll give him a purple coat from my paint box by and by, said Bertie. Yes, and red heels. That is Madame de Maintenon, that one that he called Mrs. Hemans. She begs Louis not to go on this expedition, but he turns a deaf ear. He takes Marshal Saxe with him, and we must pretend that they have thousands of men with them. The watchword is qui vive, and the answer is l'état c'est moi. That was one of his favourite remarks, you know. They land at Manchester in the dead of the night, and a Jacobite conspirator gives them the keys of the fortress. Peeping in through the doorway, Harvey observed that the municipal dustbin had been pierced with holes to accommodate the muzzles of imaginary cannon, and now represented the principal fortified position in Manchester. John Stuart Mill had been dipped in red ink, and apparently stood for Marshal Saxe. 
Louis orders his troops to surround the Young Women's Christian Association and seize the lot of them. Once back at the Louvre and the girls are mine, he exclaims. We must use Mrs. Hemans again for one of the girls. She says, never, and stabs Marshal Sachs to the heart. He bleeds dreadfully, exclaimed Bertie, splashing red ink liberally over the facade of the association building. The soldiers rush in and avenge his death with the utmost savagery. A hundred girls are killed. Here Bertie emptied the remainder of the red ink over the devoted building, and the surviving five hundred are dragged off to the French ships. I have lost a marshal, says Louis, but I do not go back empty-handed. Harvey stole away from the room and sought out his sister. Eleanor, he said, the experiment, yes, has failed. We have begun too late. End of The Toys of Peace This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Brian Roberg Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne Young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset into the street at Salem Village, but put his head back, after crossing the threshold, to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife. And Faith, as the wife was aptly named, thrust her own pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her cap while she called to Goodman Brown. "'Dearest heart,' whispered she, softly and rather sadly, when her lips were close to his ear. Prithee put off your journey until sunrise, and sleep in your own bed tonight. A lone woman is troubled with such dreams and such thoughts that she's afeard of herself sometimes. Please tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights in the year. My love and my faith, replied young Goodman Brown. Of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey, as thou callest it, forth and back again, must needs be done twixt now and sunrise. What, my sweet pretty wife, dost thou doubt me already, and we but three months married? Then God bless you, said Faith with the pink ribbons and may you find all well when you come back. Amen, cried Goodman Brown. Say thy prayers, dear Faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. So they parted, and the young man pursued his way until, being about to turn the corner by the meeting house, he looked back and saw the head of Faith still peeping after him with a melancholy air, in spite of her pink ribbons. Poor little Faith, thought he, for his heart smote him. What a wretch am I to leave her on such an errand? She talks of dreams, too. Methought as she spoke there was trouble in her face, as if a dream had warned her what work is to be done tonight. But no, no, twould kill her to think it. Well, she's a blessed angel on earth, and after this one night I'll cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. With this excellent resolve for the future, Goodman Brown felt himself justified in making more haste on his present evil purpose. He had taken a dreary road, darkened by all the gloomiest trees of the forest, which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through, and closed immediately behind. It was all as lonely as could be, and there is this peculiarity in such a solitude that the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may yet be passing through an unseen multitude. 
There may be a devilish Indian behind every tree, said Goodman Brown to himself, and he glanced fearfully behind him as he added, What if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? His head being turned back, he passed a crook of the road, and, looking forward again, beheld the figure of a man, in grave and decent attire, seated at the foot of an old tree. He arose at Goodman Brown's approach, and walked onward side by side with him. "'You are late, Goodman Brown,' said he. "'The clock of the Old South was striking as I came through Boston, and that is full fifteen minutes agone.' "'Faith kept me back a while,' replied the young man, with a tremor in his voice, caused by the sudden appearance of his companion, though not wholly unexpected. It was now deep dusk in the forest, and deepest in that part of it where these two were journeying. As nearly as could be discerned, the second traveler was about fifty years old, apparently in the same rank of life as Goodman Brown and bearing a considerable resemblance to him, though perhaps more in expression than features. Still, they might have been taken for father and son. And yet, though the elder person was as simply clad as the younger, and as simple in manner, too, he had an indescribable air of one who knew the world, and who would not have felt abashed at the governor's dinner table, or in King William's court, were it possible that his affairs should call him thither. But the only thing about him that could be fixed upon as remarkable was his staff, which bore the likeness of a great black snake, so curiously wrought that it might almost be seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent. This, of course, must have been an ocular deception, assisted by the uncertain light. "'Come, Goodman Brown,' cried his fellow-traveller. "'This is a dull pace for the beginning of a journey. "'Take my staff, if you are so soon weary.' "'Friend,' said the other, exchanging his slow pace for a full stop, "'having kept covenant by meeting thee here, "'it is my purpose now to return whence I came. "'I have scruples touching the matter thou wotst of.' "'Sayest thou so?' replied he of the serpent, smiling apart. Let us walk on, nevertheless, reasoning as we go, and if I convince thee not, thou shalt turn back. We are but a little way in the forest yet. Too far, too far, exclaimed the goodman, unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs, and shall I be the first of the name of Brown that ever took this path and kept such company, thou wouldst say, observed the elder person, interpreting his pause. Well said, Goodman Brown. I have been as well acquainted with your family as with ever a one among the Puritans, and that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem, and it was I that brought your father a pitch-pine knot, kindled at my own hearth, to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends, both, and many a pleasant walk have we had along this path, and returned merrily after midnight. I would fain be friends with you, for their sake. If it be as thou sayest, replied Goodman Brown, I marvel they never spoke of these matters. Or, verily, I marvel not, seeing that the least rumor of the sort would have driven them from New England. We are a people of prayer, and good works to boot, and abide no such wickedness. Wickedness or not, said the traveler with the twisted staff, I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me, 
the selectmen of divers towns make me their chairman, and a majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest. The governor and I, too. But these are state secrets. Can this be so? cried Goodman Brown, with a stare of amazement at his undisturbed companion. How be it? I have nothing to do with the governor and council. They have their own ways, and are no rule for a simple husbandman like me. But were I to go on with thee, how should I meet the eye of that good old man, our minister, at Salem Village? Oh, his voice would make me tremble both Sabbath day and lecture day. Thus far the elder traveler had listened with due gravity, but now burst into a fit of irrepressible mirth, shaking himself so violently that his snake-like staff actually seemed to wriggle in sympathy. Ha! 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 shouted he again and again, then composing himself, well, go on, Goodman Brown, go on. But, prithee, don't kill me with laughing. Well, then, to attend the matter at once, said Goodman Brown, considerably nettled. There is my wife, Faith. It would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Nay, if that be the case, answered the other, you can go thy ways, Goodman Brown. I would not for twenty old women like the one hobbling before us that faith should come to any harm. As he spoke he pointed his staff at a female figure on the path in whom Goodman Brown recognized a very pious and exemplary dame who had taught him his catechism in youth and was still his moral and spiritual adviser jointly with the minister and deacon Gookin. A marvel, truly, that Goody Cloyce should be so far in the wilderness at nightfall, said he. But with your leave, friend, I shall take a cut through the woods until we have left this Christian woman behind. Being a stranger to you, she might ask whom I was consorting with and whither I was going. Be it so, said his fellow traveler. Betake you to the woods, and let me keep the path. Accordingly the young man turned aside, but took care to watch his companion, who advanced softly along the road until he had come within a staff's length of the old dame. She, meanwhile, was making the best of her way, with singular speed for so aged a woman, and mumbling some indistinct words, a prayer doubtless, as she went. The traveler put forth his staff, and touched her withered neck with what seemed the serpent's tail. "'The devil!' screamed the pious old lady. "'Then Goody Cloyce knows her old friend,' observed the traveller, confronting her and leaning on his writhing stick. "'Ah, forsooth! And is it your worship indeed?' cried the good dame. "'Yea, truly is it, and in the very image of my old gossip, Goodman Brown.' the grandfather of the silly fellow that now is. But, would your worship believe it, my broomstick hath strangely disappeared, stolen, as I suspect, by that unhanged witch, Goody Cory, and that, too, when I was all anointed with the juice of smallage, and sinkfoil, and wolf spain, mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe, said the shape of old Goodman Brown. "'Ah, your worship knows the recipe,' cried the old lady, cackling aloud. "'So, as I was saying, being all ready for the meeting, and no horse to ride on, I made up my mind to foot it, for they tell me there is a nice young man to be taken into communion tonight. But now your good worship will lend me your arm, and we shall be there in a twinkling.' "'That can hardly be,' answered her friend. I may not spare you my arm, Goody Cloyce, but here is my staff, if you will. So saying, he threw it down at her feet, where, perhaps, it assumed life, being one of the rods which its owner had formerly lent to the Egyptian magi. Of this fact, however, Goodman Brown could not take cognizance, 
he had cast up his eyes in astonishment, and, looking down again, beheld neither Goody Cloyce nor the serpentine staff, but his fellow traveler alone, who waited for him as calmly as if nothing had happened. That old woman taught me my catechism, said the young man, and there was a world of meaning in this simple statement. They continued to walk onward, while the elder traveler exhorted his companion to make good speed and persevere in the path, discoursing so aptly that his arguments seemed rather to spring up in the bosom of his auditor than to be suggested by himself. As they went, he plucked a branch of maple to serve for a walking stick, and began to strip it of the twigs and little boughs, which were wet with evening dew. The moment his fingers touched them, they became strangely withered and dried up as with a week's sunshine. Thus the pair proceeded, at a good free pace, until suddenly, in a gloomy hollow of the road, Goodman Brown sat himself down on the stump of a tree and refused to go any farther. "'Friend,' said he, stubbornly, "'my mind is made up. Not another step will I budge on this errand. What if a wretched old woman do choose to go to the devil when I thought she was going to heaven? Is that any reason why I should quit my dear faith and go after her?' "'You will think better of this by and by,' said his acquaintance composedly. "'Sit here and rest yourself a while, and when you feel like moving again, there is my staff to help you along. Without more words, he threw his companion the maple stick, and was as speedily out of sight as if he had vanished into the deepening gloom. The young man sat a few moments by the roadside, applauding himself greatly, and thinking with how clear a conscience he should meet the minister in his morning walk, nor shrink from the eye of good old Deacon Gookin. And what calm sleep would be his that very night, which was to have been spent so wickedly, but so purely and sweetly now, in the arms of faith? Amidst these pleasant and praiseworthy meditations, Goodman Brown heard the tramp of horses along the road, and deemed it advisable to conceal himself within the verge of the forest, conscious of the guilty purpose that had brought him thither, though now so happily turned from it. On came the hoof-tramps and the voices of the riders, two grave old voices, conversing soberly as they drew near. These mingled sounds appeared to pass along the road, within a few yards of the young man's hiding-place, but, owing doubtless to the depth of the gloom at that particular spot, neither the travellers nor their steeds were visible. Though their figures brushed the small boughs by the wayside, it could not be seen that they intercepted, even for a moment, the faint gleam from the strip of bright sky athwart which they must have passed. Goodman Brown alternately crouched and stood on tiptoe, pulling aside the branches and thrusting forth his head as far as he durst without discerning so much as a shadow. It vexed him the more, because he could have sworn, were such a thing possible, that he recognized the voices of the minister and Deacon Gookin, jogging along quietly, as they were wont to do, when bound to some ordination or ecclesiastical council. While yet within hearing, one of the riders stopped to pluck a switch. "'Of the two, reverend sir,' said the voice like the deacons, "'I had rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting.' They tell me that some of our community are to be here from Falmouth and beyond, and others from Connecticut and Rhode Island, besides several of the Indian powwows, who, after their fashion, know almost as much deviltry as the best of us. Moreover, there is a goodly young woman to be taken into communion. Mighty well, Deacon Gookin, replied the solemn old tones of the minister. Spur up! or we shall be late. Nothing can be done, you know, until I get on the ground. The hoofs clattered again, and the voices, 
talking so strangely in the empty air, passed on through the forest, where no church had ever been gathered or solitary Christian prayed. Whither, then, could these holy men be journeying so deep into the heathen wilderness? Young Goodman Brown caught hold of a tree for support, being ready to sink down on the ground, faint and overburdened with the heavy sickness of his heart. He looked up to the sky, doubting whether there really was a heaven above him. Yet there was the blue arch and the stars brightening in it. With heaven above and faith below, I will yet stand firm against the devil, cried Goodman Brown. While he still gazed upward into the deep arch of the firmament and had lifted his hands to pray, a cloud, though no wind was stirring, hurried across the zenith and hid the brightening stars. The blue sky was still visible, except directly overhead where this black mass of cloud was sweeping swiftly northward. Aloft in the air, as if from the depths of the cloud, came a confused and doubtful sound of voices. Once the listener fancied that he could distinguish the accents of townspeople of his own, men and women, both pious and ungodly, many of whom he had met at the communion table, and had seen others riding at the tavern. The next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught but the murmur of the old forest, whispering without a wind. Then came a stronger swell of those familiar tones, heard daily in the sunshine at Salem Village, but never until now from a cloud of night. There was one voice of a young woman, uttering lamentations, yet with an uncertain sorrow and entreating for some favor which, perhaps, it would grieve her to obtain, and all the unseen multitude, both saints and sinners, seemed to encourage her onward. "'Faith!' shouted Goodman Brown, in a voice of agony and desperation, and the echoes of the forest mocked him, crying, "'Faith! Faith!' as if bewildered wretches were seeking her all through the wilderness." The cry of grief, rage, and terror was yet piercing the night, when the unhappy husband held his breath for a response. There was a scream, drowned immediately in a louder murmur of voices, fading into far-off laughter, as the dark cloud swept away, leaving the clear and silent sky above Goodman Brown. But something fluttered lightly down through the air and caught on the branch of a tree, the young man seized it and beheld a pink ribbon. "'My faith is gone!' cried he, after one stupefied moment. "'There is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given.' And, maddened with despair, so that he laughed loud and long, did Goodman Brown grasp his staff and set forth again, at such a rate that he seemed to fly along the forest path rather than to walk or run. The road grew wilder and drearier and more faintly traced and vanished at length, leaving him in the heart of the dark wilderness, still rushing onward with the instinct that guides mortal men to evil. The whole forest was peopled with frightful sounds the creaking of the trees, the howling of wild beasts, and the yell of Indians, while sometimes the wind tolled like a distant church bell, and sometimes gave a broad roar around the traveler, as if all nature were laughing him to scorn. But he was himself the chief horror of the scene, and shrank not from its other horrors. Ha! 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 roared Goodman Brown when the wind laughed at him. Let us hear which will laugh loudest. Think not to frighten me with your deviltry. Come, witch, come, wizard, come, Indian powwow, come, devil himself, and here comes Goodman Brown. You may as well fear him as he fear you. 
In truth, all through the haunted forest there could be nothing more frightful than the figure of Goodman Brown. On he flew among the black pines, brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures, now giving vent to an inspiration of horrid blasphemy, and now shouting forth such laughter as set all the echoes of the forest laughing like demons around him. The fiend in his own shape is less hideous than when he rages in the breast of man. Thus sped the demoniac on his course, until, quivering among the trees, he saw a red light before him, as when the felled trunks and branches of a clearing have been set on fire and throw up their lurid blaze against the sky at the hour of midnight. He paused, in a lull of the tempest that had driven him onward, and heard the swell of what seemed to him, rolling solemnly from a distance with the weight of many voices. He knew the tune. It was a familiar one in the choir of the village meeting-house. The verse died heavily away, and was lengthened by a chorus, not of human voices, but of all the sounds of the benighted wilderness pealing in awful harmony together. Goodman Brown cried out, and his cry was lost to his own ear by its unison with the cry of the desert. In the interval of silence he stole forward until the light glared full upon his eyes. At one extremity of an open space, hemmed in by the dark wall of the forest, arose a rock, bearing some rude natural resemblance either to an altar or a pulpit, and surrounded by four blazing pines, their tops aflame, their stems untouched, like candles at an evening meeting. The mass of foliage that had overgrown the summit of the rock was all on fire, blazing high into the night and fitfully illuminating the whole field. Each pendant twig and leafy festoon was in a blaze. As the red light arose and fell, a numerous congregation alternately shone forth, then disappeared in shadow, and again grew, as it were, out of the darkness, peopling the heart of the solitary woods at once. A grave and dark-glad company, quoth Goodman Brown. In truth they were such. Among them, quivering to and fro between gloom and splendor, appeared faces that would be seen next day at the council board of the province, and others which, Sabbath after Sabbath, looked devoutly heavenward and benignantly over the crowded pews from the holiest pulpits in the land. Some affirmed that the lady of the governor was there. At least there were high dames well known to her, and wives of honored husbands, and widows, and a great multitude and ancient maidens, all of excellent repute, and fair young girls who trembled lest their mothers should espy them. Either the sudden gleams of light flashing over the obscure field bedazzled Goodman Brown, or he recognized a score of the church members of Salem Village, famous for their especial sanctity. Good old Deacon Gookin had arrived, and waited at the skirts of that venerable saint, his revered pastor. But, irreverently consorting with these grave, reputable, and pious persons, these elders of the church, these chaste dames and dewy virgins, there were men of dissolute lives and women of spotted fame, wretches given over to all mean and filthy vice, and suspected even of horrid crimes. It was strange to see that the good shrank not from the wicked, nor were the sinners abashed by the saints. Scattered also among their pale-faced enemies were the Indian priests, or powwows, who had often scared their native forest with more hideous incantations than any known to English witchcraft. But where is faith? thought Goodman Brown, and, as hope came into his heart, he trembled. Another verse of the hymn arose, a slow and mournful strain, 
such as the pious love, but joined to words which expressed all that our nature can conceive of sin, and darkly hinted at far more. Unfathomable to mere mortals is the lore of fiends. Verse after verse was sung, and still the chorus of the desert swelled between, like the deepest tone of a mighty organ. And with the final peal of that dreadful anthem there came a sound, as if the roaring wind, the rushing streams, the howling beasts, and every other voice of the unconcerted wilderness were mingling and according with the voice of guilty man in homage to the prince of all. The four blazing pines threw up a loftier flame, and obscurely discovered shapes and visages of horror on the smoke wreaths above the impious assembly. At the same moment the fire on the rock shot redly forth and formed a glowing arch above its base, where now appeared a figure. With reverence, be it spoken, the figure bore no slight similitude, both in garb and manner, to some grave divine of the New England churches. "'Bring forth the converts!' cried a voice that echoed through the field and rolled into the forest. At the word, Goodman Brown stepped forth from the shadow of the trees and approached the congregation, with whom he felt a loathful brotherhood by the sympathy of all that was wicked in his heart. He could have well nigh sworn that the shape of his own dead father beckoned him to advance, looking downward from a smoke wreath, while a woman, with dim features of despair, threw out her hand to warn him back. Was it his mother? But he had no power to retreat one step, nor to resist, even in thought, when the minister and good old deacon Gookin seized his arms and led him to the blazing rock. Thither came also the slender form of a veiled female, led between Goody Cloyce, that pious teacher of the catechism, and Martha Carrier, who had received the devil's promise to be queen of hell. A rampant hag was she. And there stood the proselytes beneath the canopy of fire. Welcome, my children, said the dark figure, to the communion of your race. Ye have found thus young your nature and your destiny. My children, look behind you. They turned, and flashing forth, as it were, in a sheet of flame, the fiend worshippers were seen. The smile of welcome gleamed darkly on every visage. There, resumed the sable form, are all whom ye have reverenced from youth. Ye deemed them holier than yourselves, and shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with their lives of righteousness and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here are they all in my worshipping assembly. This night it shall be granted you to know their secret deeds, how hoary-bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households, how many a woman, eager for widow's weeds, has given her husband a drink at bedtime, and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom, how beardless youths have made haste to inherit their father's wealth, and how fair damsels, blush not, sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden, and bidden me, the sole guest, to an infant's funeral. By the sympathy of your human hearts for sin, ye shall scent out all the places, whether in church, bedchamber, street, field, or forest, where crime has been committed, and shall exult to behold the whole earth one stain of guilt, one mighty blood spot. Far more than this, it shall be yours to penetrate in every bosom the deep mystery of sin, the fountain of all wicked arts and which inexhaustibly supplies more evil impulses than human power, than my power at its utmost, can make manifest in deeds. And now, my children, look upon each other. They did so, and, by the blaze of the hell-kindled torches, the wretched man beheld his faith, and the wife her husband, 
trembling before that unhallowed altar. Lo, there ye stand, my children, said the figure in a deep and solemn tone, almost sad with its despairing awfulness, as if his once angelic nature could yet mourn for our miserable race. Depending upon one another's hearts, ye had still hoped that virtue were not all a dream. Now are ye undeceived. Evil is the nature of mankind. Evil must be your only happiness. Welcome again, my children, to the communion of your race. Welcome, repeated the fiend worshippers, in one cry of despair and triumph. And there they stood, the only pair, as it seemed, who were yet hesitating on the verge of wickedness in this dark world. A basin was hollowed, naturally, in the rock. Did it contain water, reddened by the lurid light? Or was it blood? Or, perchance, a liquid flame? Herein did the shape of evil dip his hand, and prepare to lay the mark of baptism upon their foreheads, that they might be partakers of the mystery of sin, more conscious of the secret guilt of others, both in deed and thought, than they could now be of their own. The husband cast one look at his pale wife, and faith at him. What polluted wretches would the next glance show them to each other, shuddering alike at what they disclosed, and what they saw? "'Faith! Faith!' cried the husband. "'Look up to heaven!' and resist the wicked one. Whether Faith obeyed he knew not. Hardly had he spoken when he found himself amid calm night and solitude, listening to a roar of the wind which died heavily away through the forest. He staggered against the rock, and felt it chill and damp. While a hanging twig, that had been all on fire, besprinkled his cheek with the coldest dew. The next morning young Goodman Brown came slowly into the street of Salem Village, staring around him like a bewildered man. The good old minister was taking a walk along the graveyard to get an appetite for breakfast and meditate his sermon, and bestowed a blessing, as he passed, on Goodman Brown. He shrank from the venerable saint, as if to avoid an anathema. Old Deacon Gookin was at domestic worship, and the holy words of his prayer were heard through the open window. "'What God doth the wizard pray to?' quoth Goodman Brown. Goody Cloyce, that excellent old Christian, stood in the early sunshine at her own lattice, catechizing a little girl who had brought her a pint of morning's milk. Goodman Brown snatched away the child as from the grasp of the fiend himself. Turning the corner by the meeting-house, he spied the head of Faith, with the pink ribbons, gazing anxiously forth, and bursting into such joy at sight of him that she skipped along the street and almost kissed her husband before the whole village. But Goodman Brown looked sternly and sadly into her face, and passed on without a greeting. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest, and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch-meeting? Be it so if you will, but, alas, it was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown. A stern, a sad, a darkly meditative, a distrustful, if not a desperate man did he become from the night of that fearful dream. On the Sabbath day, when the congregation were singing a holy psalm, he could not listen because an anthem of sin rushed loudly upon his ear and drowned all the blessed strain. When the minister spoke from the pulpit with power and fervid eloquence, and, with his hand on the open Bible, of the sacred truths of our religion, and of saint-like lives and triumphant deaths, and of future bliss, or misery unutterable. Then did Goodman Brown turn pale, dreading lest the roof should thunder down upon the gray blasphemer and his hearers. Often, waking suddenly at midnight, he
he shrank from the bosom of faith, and at morning or evening tide, when the family knelt down at prayer, he scowled and muttered to himself, and gazed sternly at his wife, and turned away. And when he had lived long, and was born to his grave a hoary corpse, followed by faith an aged woman, and children and grandchildren, a goodly procession, besides neighbors not a few, they carved no hopeful verse upon his tombstone, for his dying hour was gloom. The End of Young Goodman Brown